is Apologetics Live with Matt Slick and Andrew Rappaport, part of the community. All right, we are live, Apologetics Live. Glad that you are out here with us. We are with our resident apologist, Mr. Matt Slick from CARM, who's been doing apologetics for almost 40 years. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I just want to actually, that was actually just a test. See, last week he got upset when I said more than 30 years. He wanted, he had, no, 39. He 39. He wanted to make me the precision. 39. I want to see if you can do the same thing when I said almost 40. I want to see. <laughs> no, because you're right. It's almost 40. It's 39. That's the number of mercy. I was right when I said. Bible. It was yeah. right when I said more than 32. <laughs> Technically, uh, yeah, but let's just not shave off too much. I've been, I've been this a long time. A long time. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so All right. this is a show for you folks who are watching live. You can join in. You can ask any kinds of questions you want. Uh, we usually do, for the most part, uh, 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 um, the link to join is at apologeticslive.com. You can see the link that's usually we end up having to wait to put that link in until just before we go live because of the way Google Hangouts work. But we may change that in the future. Um. We we are gonna uh, we do have someone in who says he's a soft atheist, uh, wants to discuss the position of uh, objective standard of morality. So that'll be a good one. Um, Matt, there's something that happened. I, I actually didn't get a chance to talk to you yet about this. But, uh, Stand to reason. I don't know if you're familiar with that ministry, Greg Kokel's. Yeah, I've talked to Greg before. Yeah. So they they had they do a thing where they get uh, their speakers to come in and will. Um, go into youth groups and either pretend to be a Muslim or pretend to be an atheist and grill the students. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And the students don't know that right. they're actually Christian right. just so, you know, so that these guys realize that there's some tough questions that, you know, to be answered. And then they start showing how to answer these things simply. Uh, well, I guess someone uh, that's on their mailing list that they actually invited into one of the youth groups to grill students themselves, uh, a professing atheist. And uh -huh. that person chose not to show, but gave the email where they talked about doing this to a guy called the friendly atheist. And the friendly atheist, I guess, made a mockery of it, saying that they were probably asking soft just so that they could say, oh, see, they 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 were able to stump the, the fake atheist, the pretend atheist. Um, but I kind of saw something that is pretty common that you and I see all the time. Guys that say they have really good arguments that come in saying atheism, and then they use dishonesty in their argumentation, um, where they'll sit there and instead of dealing with real definitions, they, they do, you know, they just misrepresent. And so I think that's one of the things we, we see pretty regularly with a lot of the atheist community, right? Yeah. You know, <laughs> I try to get him talking. What does he do? All right. So before we bring the first person. I, I asked, I answered the question. I love doing that to you too. You set me up. I go, yeah, just dead air. <laughs> it, always, it gets you every time. Well, sometimes they're dishonest. Um, sometimes, sometimes their argument is just not good, you know. So, so we should we should uh, you know you're you're with Carm.org. I don't know if I plug this Carm uh, dot org Christian Apologetics Research Ministry. Uh, Thirty nine years Matt's been doing because we he likes the precision of it. Um, I'm Andrew Rapport with Striving for Eternity, um, and uh, just to to give a plug. Um, actually, I. Do I have the commercial? I'll give a plug later for the conference we got coming up with uh, Justin Peters. Um, so we'll probably play that later. But uh, since we got someone in here, I'm going to add him and hint to folks if you want to get in and everyone likes to come in at the end and ask all these really great questions and you get good dialogue, come in right when we begin and you get the floor until other people start showing up. So uh, that's the smart way of doing it. You get most time and uh, we don't have to cut you off. So uh, I just added uh, John here and John says he's a soft atheist who came in to discuss his position that there is no objective standard for morality. So you can unmute yourself, John. Yeah. I hope you can. You hear me okay? okay. Yeah. yeah, there we go. 
So go ahead, ask your question. Uh, so basically, uh, I was just, um, I, I see that most uh, people, including uh, Matt Slick, uh, uh, believe in the idea that there is a, an objective standard of morality. And I believe that this is a, a mistake. And uh, I believe I can demonstrate how it's a mistake. Okay, go ahead. So first of all, uh, I believe you, uh, you believe in the correspondence theory of truth. Is that correct? Yeah, I lean towards that. Okay, and so, or uh, propositional uh, logic, you know, something is true if it corresponds to uh, a standard. Yeah, basic, basically, yeah. Okay. So, first of all, uh, the question is, is how can you, what is the, how do we determine what is the correct moral standard? Well, God reveals it to us. But how do we know that, I, how can that be, how can that possibly be correct? if uh, God is simply giving us his biased opinion. How can it be correct if God is telling us what's right? Yeah, isn't that just God's subjective opinion? Oh, define what you mean by subjective. Well, objective means it's unbiased by any personal, any personal position. Subjective would be biased by their position. So objective means not biased? Uh, in, independent of any uh, personal opinion or, or uh, position, perspective. In relationship to who? In relationship to anyone. Okay. So um, so is God's um, declaration of what is right and wrong, therefore, incorrect? It would be subjective. And if it's based on his character, which would not be subjective because he's absolute, knows all things all the time, he knows exactly what is right because it reflects his character, then it's just based on his character. If you want to call it subjective, then go ahead and call it subjective. When you say it's right, what do you mean? What's the standard by which you measure that is right? God reveals what is right as, as is consistent with his character. So basically what you're saying is that it's consistent with God's character is what makes it right? Yeah. And that's your opinion? That's what God has revealed to us in the Word of God, the Bible. Okay, but again, you're going with this is what God has revealed. So God yeah. reveals his position, his, his subjective yeah. position. Well, he's telling us what is right and is wrong. And he's telling us so that it's no longer subjective to us, but now it's objective to us. So you think that something can be objective to us even though it's subjective to somebody else? Well, the way you're defining subjectivity. You see, if God is the one who knows everything all the time and he reveals to us out of his character what is right, then it becomes an objective truth for us, right? Wouldn't you agree? I would not agree. Wait it's a minute. Subjective. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. If it's no, 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 no. If the truth is revealed from God, then to us, isn't that truth then non-subjective to us? Well, now you're calling it truth. Is not the truth of the moral reality not subjective to us, but objective? Isn't that correct? Well, again, you're talking about a moral reality being true. You're, you're assuming okay. something. Is when God true. reveals something to us, he reveals something based on his character, about what is right and what is wrong, thou shalt not murder, for example, then it becomes an objective truth to us. Is that not correct? I would say that is not correct. It's not objective truth to so us. It's now, it's, it's, it's now it's a subjective truth to you? No, it is. It is. If it's not subjective. It is not objective. Opinion. If it's neither subjective or objective, then what is it? It is not. It is subjective. The question is not whether it's subjective. Wait a minute. Or how objective. can it? How can it be the subjective? That means it's based on. That means it's based on your personal preference, your personal desires. But if it comes from God, it's not then based on your personal preferences. So it'd be objective to you, wouldn't it? It would be. It would be based on God's personal opinions and desires. If I said to you, to, you're not. You're not. You don't really want to answer the question because no. I've already got you worked into a corner. The fact is God reveals his word to us. He reveals what is morally right. He is the standard of righteousness. He reveals it to us. The issue of subjectivity and objectivity deals with us. And when what we're talking about here is what is morally right and wrong. You don't have all knowledge. You do not know if God exists. You're, you're, you're a soft atheist. So therefore, the only thing you have is your subjective opinion about things. So you are not qualified to be able to tell us what is objective, particularly when we as Christians tell you that God has revealed what is objective objective to us that's what i'm telling you so if god reveals something to us it's no longer um it's it's not a subjective thing to us it's an objective thing to us isn't it 
No, it is not. You want to claim that it's objective to okay. you. But so if God reveals it something, it's now it's subjective to us? If he says don't lie, that means it's just subjected to my opinion? It is subjective to God's opinion. If God is saying this is what you God, should do. Yeah, God is absolutely, let's just say it's subjected to God's opinion. And I keep asking you about you, and you keep misrepresenting the answer by misrepresenting my question. I ask you, let's try it again. Is not the revealed truth from God to you, and it's objective to you? Can you answer that? The, the idea that something is objective to me does not make any sense. What do you mean, objective? What does objectivity mean? Objectivity means free of any bias if it is god's bias, wait, 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 free of, a wait, wait. Thing, can you can you show me that definition it. show me that definition in an authoritative source that's what it means now now you want me to appeal to authority what dude are you serious sorry, sorry, you, wait a minute wait wait what wait a minute will you, accept? you want to go off let's just go off your subjective opinion what it is okay let's just do that what dictionary would you accept Whatever one you want to use, tell me what objectivity is. Let's give something besides your subjective opinion of what it really is. Let's go to something more objective. Okay, I, I have to go to uh, Webster's Dictionary. What does it say for objective? <laughs> okay, so Webster's Dictionary, okay. And I'll type in the word objective. You should have already done this, uh, this homework. You should have already know what your terms mean. No, I, I, I know what my terms mean, but... I can't uh, say that they're going to mean the same thing to you. You've already demonstrated that they don't. Relating to or existing as an object of thought without consideration of independent existence of or relating to being or object phenomena or condition in the realm of sensible experience, independent of individual thought and perceptual by all observers. So what makes you think that your subjective definition is the right one? No, the my subjective being my subjective definition being the right one is simply a matter of consensus, just like morality. Whoa, you complain about appeal to authority. Now you're appealing to argumentum and populum, the ma majority. No, no, so which, no, no. Which, no, no. The consensus. Not, so consensus is what what uh, it means now. No, it's a matter so of what, what's what your definition. Of, what's your definition again? You have object, what object. standard is. What's your definition of of objectivity? Free of bias. Free of bias. Okay, personal hold on a bias. Sec. Any free bias. of personal. Oh, free so what you're doing is. Bias. Oh, so by definition, you just define it that way. Can you demonstrate to me that that's the correct definition to work with? Can you demonstrate it's not? I asked you to demonstrate your assertion to be true. You're asking me what my definition is. My yeah, and I asked you if you can verify that it's true. You said free from bias. That's correct. That is my definition. If that's you accept definition. my definition, then we have a consensus and we can move forward. If you don't accept my my definition, we don't have a consensus and we can't move forward. Well, I don't accept your definition because I read what the Webster's Dictionary, which you referenced. You said use that one. I did. It doesn't agree with you. I would beg to differ. If we are using Webster's Dictionary, it agrees with what I'm saying. Wow. Um, so relating to or existing as an object of thought without consideration of independent existence, that agrees with your definition that it means free of personal bias? Yes. Wow of or relating to or being an object, phenomena, or condition in the realm of sensible experience, independent of individual thought and perceptual by all observers, having reality independent of the mind, that means without bias? That is correct. Well, okay. Um, I guess uh, then you concede that I'm correct. I am conceding that uh, if you want to agree with the Webster's Dictionary, and I agree with the Webster's Dictionary, on the definition, then we can move forward. I, I'm glad that you uh, just acknowledge that I'm correct and that you don't know what you're doing. Thank you. I mean, that was easy. It didn't take much. Um, I think you're being disingenuous now, Matt. Uh, oh, thank you. I, I 
didn't think that you liked me that much, but I, you know, I, it's a nice compliment. Thank you. No, my, my point is that I think that you're you're basically assuming that you won without actually demonstrated the the case. No, I I uh, I don't have a new car. No. No, I don't. I don't know where you got that, but uh, exactly what I'm talking about. If we don't have a consensus of meaning, we can't move forward. No, I'm not bald. What? Where are you getting that? Seriously, what is up with you? Wow. I guess, John, you don't know what you're doing, do you? Because if I'm going to read you a definition and then you just reinterpret it to me, whatever you want it to mean in light of what you desire, then I can do the exact same thing to you. If you're not going to go with what the consensus of what you required was Webster's Dictionary, which does not say what you said, and then you say, but it does say that, how are we going to have any rational discourse whatsoever? Since you cannot demonstrate to me that you know what you're talking about in subjectivity, you can't define it. When I asked you to define it, you said you define it. I said, where do you want me to go? Webster's. You couldn't even define it for yourself. I go there. It doesn't agree with you. And then you say it does. Do you really understand how ridiculous your presentation is so far oh i understand uh how you're making it out and how you're trying to put it to the audience that uh, is watching i'm not trying to i'm simply doing what's obvious you're the one demonstrating that you don't have the ability to think critically in this area you just defined it in a way not consistent with what the dictionary said that you want me to reference what you want to do is say it means any personal bias and you say well god has a personal therefore it's not objective so what you're doing is defining it in a very narrow way specifically and purposely which is not done in the dictionary you wanted to cite so you can apply it to god so that you can try and win an argument which really is no argument let's look at entry 1b when i asked you specifically i said is it objective to you the, the truth you said no, it's not. You, and it's, then you said it's also not subjective. We only have two options here, subjectivity and objectivity. And then I asked you, if it's not subjective and it's not objective, then what is it? Can you answer that question? And my answer was that it's not about subjectivity or objectivity. It's about your, your characterization of it being true. That's what it is? So that's your subjective opinion about what is true? About the word subjectivity and objectivity? I'd like to reference the 1B. 1B, of relating to, or which I've already quoted several times, yeah. of being or, or object, of relating to, uh, of being or object, phenomena or condition in the realm of sensible experience, independent of individual thought and perceptible by all observers. Yeah. Yeah. Independent of individual thought. So any individual, individual thought and perceptible by all observers. Okay. Reality independent of the mind. You are independent of the mind? No, I'm saying that this is the definition of objectivity that we are referring to. Okay. Having existence independent of the mind. Something that exists without us knowing it exists. No. Something it's independent of the mind. Independent it's, of our mind. If so it's independent example, of our mind, if it's independent of our minds, then it exists without us having to know it, right? This glass I'm holding in my hand, does this exist independent? of your mind no i'm seeing it so you're saying that if you cease to exist this glass would cease to exist as well wow did does that did anybody hear me say that no you Not said at all. you're seeing it so you're saying it exists dependent upon your mind it's no i didn't say that i didn't say that no i didn't say that i didn't say that is it dependent or independent it's not dependent upon my mind, which is why I said, that if a mind, if a mind is not there, it still exists. So that makes it not dependent. It makes it independent upon the of mind. your mind. Not dependent upon the mind for its existence. That's which right. mind is it talk? Which mind is the dictionary talking about there? Any and all. Any and all. Does it say any and all? It doesn't say any and all. It's implied. Okay. So, in other words, you've just now defined God out of existence because. An object exists objectively without any mind. So since God would know about it, it can't exist or he can't exist. Is that what you're trying to say? No, that's not what I'm trying to say at all. What are you trying to say? I'm trying to say that things which exist in material reality exist independent of whether or not 
I'm thinking about them, you're thinking about them. Yeah, or I know that. Thinking about them? That's what objectivity is. Yeah. Uh, okay, we come to a consensus to of what that means. To us, yes. No, not to us. To us makes it subjective. It does not depend on our existence for its existence. It doesn't it's not, depend it's upon not anyone. Anyone's existence. How do you know that's the case? So let's let's take an example, okay? Wait a minute. How do you know the glass is not dependent upon anyone's existence? I don't know that. You just said it's not dependent upon anyone's. No, I'm saying that that's what the standard of objectivity is. Okay. You know, you're running you're in circles because in you know what's going on. You know, what? you know where the problem is, and you're just running around in circles playing word games. With no, you. don't don't tell me what I know. <laughs> you're not making any sense to me. Okay, so well, let me, let's try let me back up, back up, and try and make some point. Try and make some point. I mean, I don't know what you're doing. Okay. You believe in the correspondence theory of truth, correct? I said I lean towards that way, yes. If you lean, does that mean you believe it or you don't believe it? Or believe I lean it? towards you that. Okay, good enough. That's what I said. Now, okay. what's your next statement? Okay, so... A correspondence theory of truth requires that a standard exists, correct? I I can't standard, say yes or no. A standard against which you would measure any proposition. I can't say yes or no. I don't know what John, you mean by proposition. You define, John, define your term. Don't yeah. You define it. So for example, if you want to say that this glass <laughs> exists, the standard against which you measure is existence standard are you serious the standard that i measure is a it, it's a glass is against its own existence so i claim that this glass exists yeah the claim is measured against its actual existence does it actually exist or i could say this is a toaster then you measure the claim of is this glass a okay. toaster okay you're, you're just making statements is. You're just making statements that linguistically agree with what the statements are revealing about an object. Okay, now what? Okay, so then if we're going to say that there is a standard. Standard, what's a standard? That's a great question. So a standard is an object or a thing against which we measure other things or compare other things. All right, okay, let's go with that, yeah. Okay. So if we're going to say that there is a an objective standard, then yeah. that objective standard must be a standard which is independent of any particular opinion, position. Oh, I get what you're doing. So by the definition that you're using, you automatically win by defining it the way you do. That's all you're doing. You're saying A is B because B is A. What you're doing is you're saying objectivity means that there can be no mind involved in anything but the knowledge concept or knowledge claim about it. Therefore, that means God can't have any objective standard easily. That's what you've done. All you've done is define it that way. Not just God, but anybody. There cannot be that's, any that's, objective that's, standard. That's all you've done is just define it. That's all you've done is just to define it that way. And that's, that's it. So, so you want to say there's no objective moral standard. So you're going to say there's no more object, objective standard to God, right? There is no objective moral standard at all at all it's, it's so you know so you're saying then you know of all situations all minds and all standards and so you universally there's no objective moral standard no i'm saying that the whole notion of an objective standard is nonsensical okay are, are statements true or false based on what standard oh crap are you serious is two plus, two plus two equals four is that true by the standard of mathematics yes is a statement true or false? I am a man. Is that is it simply true? It's not simply true. It's true based on the standard that we agree upon. What's a standard? What's a standard? The standard we agree upon, which happens to be whether what defines you as a man, and whether that standard is is something we agree upon as correct. Okay. <clears throat> so, is a statement true or false? Is a statement true or false depends upon the standard. If we're talking about <clears throat> the standard of... Okay. A horse normally has four legs. Is that true or false? 
since we have a standard of what horses is, which we agree to commonly, we can say, yes, a horse normally has four legs. The uh, English language uses verbs and nouns. Is that true or false? Since we agree upon the standard of the English language, <clears throat> yes, we can say it is true. Okay, so uh, the square root of, of uh, nine is three. Is that true or false? Since we agree on the standard of what nine and square roots and three are, yes, okay. we can say that is true. Okay, so uh, yours is, it's all dependent on the standard. Okay, so here's a statement. Is it true or false? It's always wrong for anyone to torture babies to death merely for one's personal pleasure. Based on what standard? You tell me. You're the one who's developing all the standards. So if we agree upon the standard uh, that torturing babies is wrong because we have a notion that it's not, it's not good to, to cause harm to babies, then... Define what good is. What's good? Good is just a subjective, uh, subjective judgment that we have that says this is something that's desirable well, or, or something so, is wrong. So you, right. can't, you can't know if it's good or bad to torture babies to death merely for their personal pleasure. Uh, I can know for myself whether it is, and I can know based on a particular standard that I am aware of. And what's your belief? What's your opinion on this? It is always wrong for everyone to torture babies to death merely for their personal pleasure. It is my agree personal, or disagree? It is my personal opinion that it is always wrong to do so. Okay, so I just said it's always wrong for everyone. So your personal opinion is that there is a universal absolute moral standard that applies to everybody, independent of their existence and independent of their desires and knowledge. You just affirmed an objective moral standard. No, I would not say independent of... Sure it is. No. It's your opinion that it exists. It's your opinion that it's true for everybody, everybody all the time. That's an objective standard to them. It is not objective, but it is absolute and it is universal. Whoa. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You just said that according to your belief, it's always wrong for everyone. That's what we call an objective standard. Okay. That it applies yeah. universally to everybody. It's independent of their preferences or personal preferences. That's what objectivity means. That's what the real definition means. <clears throat> So now you're defining what the real definition means. So you're redefining it. I'm not redefining it. You're the one who said bias. Yeah. Look, is it always true? Is a statement true? It's always wrong for anyone. And you said, yeah, it is always wrong for anyone. How do you ha assert that as being a universally valid statement in your subjective, non-objective moral universe? It is the standard which I hold, hold to. It is the standard that I would impose upon others. Whoa. So now you would impose upon others your opinion? Yes, absolutely. Everybody okay. does. So you have the right now to impose upon everybody your subjective standard. What do you mean by right? Oh, brother. So you have the right. You have the authority. It's, you're the one who's saying it's good for you to do this. That You are the one who said, yeah, I would impose it upon everybody else. So you're the one who's saying you have that right to be able to do that. I'm saying that if others did not agree with me about torturing babies, I would actually act against their desires and wills to prevent them to do so. Yes. Okay. Are they wrong if they disagree with you? By the standard that I hold to and the standard by which society would generally hold them to, yes. If so your subjective standard, right, how do you know your subjective standard is the right one? Again, what do you mean by the right one? How do you know your subjective standard is the right one? Because you want to impose it on everybody else. Why should anybody else listen to you? Why is yours the one that should be listened to? So basically, again, it's a matter of consensus. It's a matter of agreement among the members of society. If they don't it's agree with you, why, sh why do you have the right to impose your value on people that they don't agree with you? In that society, I don't suppose I would have that right. You just said you do. You said you, no, you have I the right to impose it on others. Right. Yes, I you do. You, you said you right. would force it on other people. Yes, I would. That you wouldn't be doing it because you don't have the right. You'd be doing it because you say you're having, having the right. You're inconsistent. No. no, I would not say I have the right. But I would oh, say so you right. don't have the right, but you would impose it on them anyway. Yes, because I feel strongly against the torture of babies. So you feel it, and that's why your opinion is the one that should be imposed upon others by your judgment. I would say that, yes, I, I would impose it on other people, 
based on how I feel about that particular subject. And okay. I would have the consensus of the vast majority of society, I believe. Who gives a flying rip what the consensus of the majority says? Who You don't even know if that's the right standard. The consensus of the majority of people believe slavery was right and wrong at different times in different parts of the world. Consensus means nothing. It's called argumentative ad populum. It's a fallacy of logical argumentation, which you've employed several times. Now, so if I were to come into your home, or to come in your home with a gun, I would not do this. But I came in your home and I robbed you. And you said, I don't like it. And I say, bang, they shoot you. Am I right or wrong for doing that? You would be wrong by my standard because it's, it's something that I would I'm not talking about your standard. Not my standard. Let's talk about my standard. I'm the one. To, am I right or am I wrong? You would have to tell me whether or not that agrees with the standard that you believe in and hold to. So if I say I believe that this is okay for me to do and I shoot you, am I wrong for that objectively? No. Objectively, no. There's no possible right. because there's so no, there's no problem with it. It's not an issue of right or wrong for you, is it? It's just an issue of who has the gun. When you say it's it's not a, an issue of right or wrong, there's nothing wrong with it. What I'm saying is that I have a problem with it. You, in that particular hypothetical situation, would not. I don't care if you have a, a problem with it. Who cares? I got the gun. So exactly. What? And so it's just a matter of force. So this is where we have morality. Morality. Wait a minute. You said it was okay to force your view that it's wrong for everybody to do that thing, but the baby thing, you said it's okay to do that. So is it okay for me to do that. Is it, be consistent? Is it okay for me to shoot you and use my force? I said I would do that, and you're saying that you would shoot me. In that such hypothetical situation, let no one take it out of context. I'm right, not going to do right, it. Right, right, right. But you, you're inconsistent. You said you would force your view on others, and that's okay with you. But if I do the exact same thing, then it's not okay with you. So your system contradicts itself. How it could it be true? It doesn't contradict itself at all. I'm saying morality is a matter of consensus. If we disagree with each other, we have conflicting morals uh, or ethics, then we don't live peacefully among each other. It's talking about you and me, you and me, morality. you and me, you and me. Conflict. There's t there's three factors: you, me, and my Glock. All right. Yeah. So the Glock and me win. The consensus yep. is. And if, if I happen to have a buddy of mine and, and it's two people against you, our consensus wins. And That's so therefore, true. according to you, it's okay to do. No, not according to me, it's okay to do. According to I don't you, give a you I said, okay no, 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 no. According to us, no, according to what you're saying, to be consistent, you have to say, yes, it's right, because the consensus would agree. No, 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 I'm saying that as far as society is concerned, Society might say it's all right to 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 come. Oh, in. so you disagree with slavery back in the eighteen hundreds? Absolutely, I disagree with slavery in the eighteen hundreds. But the consensus of society was that it was okay. Who are you? You are so inconsistent. No, I'm not inconsistent at all. Yeah, I would be inconsistent if I suggested that there was an objective moral standard which permitted slavery. What? Wait and a minute. Opposed it, or an objective moral standard which opposed slavery and then permitted it. You so, said that you went with a consensus. I okay, the consensus of America 200 years ago said slavery was okay. No, you, by your own view, would have to say, well, they were right. It was wrong. It was okay to hold slaves. That's no, what you would say. I, no, what I would say is that society is saying that it's right, and I would be in direct opposition to society, just as many of the people in that society were. You said by consensus. Were they right when the consensus said that slavery was okay? By the standard of society at that time, they were right. Okay, so they were right. Now, here's a problem. So 200 years ago, they were right, but now they would be wrong if the consensus was still the same? If the consensus was still the same that slavery is right or wrong, I'm not quite following your question. That, that was right. If the consensus today was the same as it was 200 years ago, you have to say that it was, it was okay to do. If the consensus of society today said that slavery is still right, I would still be opposed to it, but society would still be okay. <clears throat> You'd be inconsistent because you said your morality goes with the consensus. So now you're not saying your morality goes with the consensus. No, you're inconsistent that is not what yet I, again. No, that is not what I'm saying, nor what I said. What I said is I have uh, my sense of morality, which may differ from that of society. And if it, it differs from society, I'm willing, in many instances, not all, to actually go against what society says. And so if, that, the society, right, but so if the society I lived in said it's okay to torture babies or to enslave people, I would be opposed to that society, and I would act to subvert that society and prevent the, the what I consider to be 
wrong and immoral and harmful, even though that's not what society is saying is. Okay, do you believe in universal moral absolutes? I believe that a universal moral absolute is something that a person can hold and say that all society or all people ought to behave a particular way. But I do not believe that such a universal moral absolute is an objective fact. Is a, uh, is a moral an abstraction? Morals are, in a sense, an abstraction, yes. So it's an abstraction. So you have a universal, absolute moral truth. I would not call it a truth. It's not true that we should not torture babies to death? We sh it's okay to do it? Or is, or is it false? Statements are true or false. So Statements is it true or is it false, false that it's always wrong? Standard. Is, is it true or false? It's always wrong for everyone to torture babies to death merely for one's personal pleasure. Is that true or is it false? According to whose standard? According to my standard, it is true. According to some other person who enjoys that and believes that that's what people should do, that would be false. So then you would have the ability to justify that it's okay to murder people, babies, torture them to death merely for their personal pleasure. If it's their opinion, then you'd say, well, for them, it's okay because it is okay for them. No, I'm saying that they would think that it's okay. I it's, would not justify their behavior according to my standard. I who cares? So whose standard is right? Yours or theirs? They differ with you. Which one's the right one? Again, you're asking whether or not there's a, or you're basically trying to get me to say that there's an objective moral standard when there's not. Which one's right or wrong if, if uh, you disagree on something? By whose standard? You, you two are disagreeing. Which one's right or which one's wrong? They both can't be right, and they both can't be wrong because they're mutually exclusive. So sure. one person would say, hypothetically, it's always wrong to murder, and, and someone else might say, it's not always wrong to murder, or it's always wrong to lie, not always lie, whatever it is. There can't be a third option. How do you determine if either one is true, or both are true, or are both false? Because if you can't decide if one is true or the other one is false, then you don't have any way of knowing if there is any truth or is any falsity, and your statements don't have any truth or falsity value to them. So again, it depends on the standard that you're measuring the question against. So you don't get it. If you no, cannot determine it. what is true and false, even your statements about what is true and your opinions have no meaning because they have no truth or, val or false value to them. They're nothing more than your personal preference of subjectivity. And the only thing you've got to offer is, it's just what I like. That's all you've got. And who but gives a flying rip? But what you're saying is that uh, I have to compare the standard or compare the statement to some standard, some objective standard uh, for it to be an objective truth. Well, that's what you keep on pointing at and saying, how do I do that? But the point is that all standards are subjective. The all standards are subjective. subjective. Are you absolutely standard, sure about that? The only standard or the only thing that's subjective is our measurement against the standard. And, can, and we can say objectively, yet this applies to the standard and is, is true, or this applies to the standard and is false. So um, it you, are, you familiar, that standard. are you familiar with basic logic? Yes. Law of identity? Yes. What is it? Law of identity is the notion that a, an a entity is identical to itself. What's the law of non-contradiction? It is the idea that no two propositions uh, which are mutually contradictory can be true simultaneously. Law of excluded middle. That if you have two propositions which entail all options or all possibilities, that there is no third option which is neither the, the one proposition nor the other. In other words, the LEM, law of excluded middle, says statements are either true or false. See, what you're doing is you're rephrasing things to find favor with your subjective opinion. And then what you're trying to do is argue from your subjective opinion upon others. Do you see the hypocrisy here? You're trying to impose a value upon others that's nothing more than your subjective opinion. So I do not see that as, as, a, as hypocrisy, but I do see... Sure it is. No. It, is only, it? it would only be hypocrisy if I am imposing a standard upon others which I do not hold for myself. Well, um, <clears throat> you see, does God exist? I don't know. Does morality exist? Morality, as I've defined it, exists in the minds of the individuals holding such a notion. Okay, does universal absolute moral truths exist? Do they? Universal absolute moral truths exist? No. Yeah. Okay, That's so they don't exist. So, so you're now That's saying, so when I... Terms, Matt. 
So I'm saying that universal moral propositions or truths do exist. Now, your statement and my statement cannot both be true, correct? That is correct. So which one is true? The one which conforms to reality. And how would you know it conforms to reality? We have to look at the, whether or not the statement that you made makes semantic sense, whether or not you can say that there's such a thing as objective standards. Specifically, and how would you do that? How, how would, would you do, do that? that? Will we look at the- uh, you, 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 you. How would I do it? I would say, okay, what is the standard by which we can measure whether or not an objective standard exists? What's the standard by which you can measure a standard? Yes, because all truth is comparative. You already agreed or said that you lean that way. You have to compare truth or a proposition say, whether or not it's true. Let's back up. Standard. Let's back up. I say there are such things as universal moral absolutes. You say no. I'm, I'm asking you, tell me how to determine which statement is correct. Hey, Matt, try not to talk over each other. Okay. How do you determine which one's correct? So how would I determine which statement is correct? I would first have to, to parse out the statement and say, does do the words actually make any sense together? It's like saying, is there a true, true favorite color? What's your standard of, of true parsing for the words to make sense? So when we parse language and we parse uh, sentences, we have to, basically what we're parsing is the meaning. So we're saying, what do these particular words actually mean? And when we put them together, do they actually mean something that can be rationally comprehended? How do you know that's correct? How do you know what the meaning of a certain word is? So the meaning of a certain word is a matter of consensus. That's why we have so many different languages out there with so many different words and so many different meanings. So how do you know that a, manage, a manner of consensus is the right uh, way to go with what words mean? So how do we know this really comes down to a matter of pragmatism? Does it actually work to communicate ideas, to actually in, interact with the universe, to actually survive and, and to, to thrive in society? So you're, that's called pragmatism. What yes. works seems to be the truth. Yeah, well, that's obviously well, no, flawed. It's it's, what is the truth? It's, it's what works is what seems to work. And, and what works works, which is tautologous. Yes. It doesn't really produce anything. I'm asking you, Show me. Get, explain right now how you're going to, and then arrive, use whatever it is you explain, whatever method you use, and tell us which statement is true. There are no objective moral truths. There are objective moral truths. Please go tell us, go through the process, connect the dots, of, and tell us how you arrive at which one is absolutely true. Okay. So a um, moral is a prescription or a proscription of behavior. So it's, it's basically something which we say people ought to do. So can there be an, a, a standard of what people ought to do, which exists apart from any person thinking what people ought to do? And so if we say, if it, if it can, then we can say that that's objective. But if we say there can't be a standard which exists apart from anybody thinking it, then that can't be objective. It doesn't have any independent existence. It exists only in a person's mind. Tell us which statement's true. I ask you to, to conclude which one's true. So if we say, can an objective moral standard exist? Well, we say, can a moral standard exist independent of any person, any person's mind? Well, no, we, we, we can't see that that happens because all moral standards exist only in people's minds. They don't have independent existence. Therefore, they cannot exist objectively. There cannot be an objective moral standard. Okay. So you said a moral is a prescription of behavior, something that people ought to do. That's correct. Okay. Or something why, that they ought not to do. Why ought they do it? That again is the whole thing about the, the subjectivity of the of the moral statement. That's why ought they do anything? Why ought, explain why they explain why they ought to do something? So, in a general sense, a person ought to do something because either they feel like 
they have a sentiment which says that this is something that ought to be done in order to create a particular ideal or maintain a particular ideal, or they ought not to do it for similar reasons. So odd is based on nothing more than personal preference. Preference or sentiment, basically, yes. And uh, how do you know that this is the right way to determine what someone ought to do? How do I know whether something is what somebody ought to do? Is that the question? Well, no, you said that uh, what they, no, I, I, asked, what you asked. I asked why ought they do something. You said they ought to do something because they feel they, it ought to be done based on preference and sentiments. Yes, this is basically what uh, what the, the whole is ought uh, dilemma or question that okay. David Hume talked about way back uh, in the okay. early time. So if, if I feel uh, something that I ought to do is come over and rob you, and I sentimentally think that's what I ought to do, then that is a, a good moral behavior according to you. No, according to you. No, according to you. No, according to you, because you're the one that's having that thought that you ought no. to do. No, you said that this is what's defined by, and you're saying that one, that's what makes it good. I applied it and say, this is what I'm doing, so therefore it is good by nature. No, no. So uh, either you're misunderstanding me deliberately or intentionally. I'm going to assume that it was unintentional. So what? Someone's got their, their thing like, go ahead. Yeah, no. Okay, so what, I, what I'm saying is that if a particular individual thinks that this is what they ought to do or what others ought to do that is their individual subjective standard of behavior if they're imposing it upon another person that's what is called morals or morality if it's self-imposed upon themselves that's what we would call ethics is it right to impose a certain view on anybody else or is it wrong well, in my personal opinion, it is right under certain circumstances to do so. Society generally feels that it's wrong to do it under certain circumstances and right to do it in others. That's why we have police officers, for example. So what you've given me here is sometimes slavery is okay, sometimes slavery is not okay. You don't have any standard by which you can judge what is true or false. You don't have any standard by which you can say something is moral or immoral, other than to say it's just what people prefer, and then it's by popular vote. This is what you've, you've uh, really given us. And you don't know that, that all your opinions are true or not. They're nothing more than your opinions about this. Now, I'm going to bring this home to you. What you've done is do nothing other than give us a personal opinion about something where you say in your personal opinion, objective morals can't uh, stand. But the problem with your personal opinion is your personal opinion is nothing more than your personal opinion. And it does not demonstrate that any objective standards do or do not exist. It's just your subjective opinion. This is the problem with subjectivity. It's self-refuting. When you have a subjective preference, what you're doing, you're saying, I believe it's right. Well, how do you know it's right? Because I believe it. Well, what makes it right? Because I believe it. It goes nowhere. You can't use logic to do this because to do logic means you have to have absolute truths by which you can then raise in order to argue about morality. The problem with logic and morality is you can't bridge the is-ought gap. And if you studied in philosophy, you should know this, the is-ought gap problem. When I asked you why ought someone do something, I was asking you to bridge the is-ought gap. And all you did was give me back to the subjectivity issue, which is not bridging the is-ought gap. All it's doing is saying, well, it's just my, my opinion. Well, that's nice. You have your opinion, but your opinion has no bearing on whether or not something is true or whether something is not true or whether or not there is an objective moral or whether or not there is not an objective moral because your subjective, subjective opinion about morality is based upon you and as i said their subjective opinion is ultimately self-refuting you've given us nothing to work with and you've only refuted yourself i would agree in part with what you said but the part i would disagree with is the idea that there's no subject that that uh, everything's subjective in, in my position is not oh you so you're saying there's objective truths i'm saying that there are Truth is based on whether or not it conforms to a particular standard. What standard? So in the case of existential truth, the standard is existence. Wait, true, but truth is a statement. Existence is not a truth. It's an actuality. That's correct. You, 
you don't understand what, apparently what truth is. The word tree is not true or false, but the statement there is a tree in my backyard is either true or false. That's correct. And what is the what is the standard by which that statement can be considered true or false? Well, in the case of that testable statement, I would go out and take a look, and that would be based on empiricism. But you don't do that Correct. with morality. Correct. Because you can't. So, because it's a different issue. And it is morality is an abstraction. And you admitted that already. Yeah. And yet you also admitted, in your opinion, there's universal moral absolutes. Yes. And yet you're saying that you are a subjectivist, which means everything's based upon your opinion. And your opinion is that there's universal moral absolutes, which means that it's imposed upon everybody, not just subjectively, but objectively, which refutes no. yourself. No. Yes, you did. No, no. So here's the thing. I agreed that there are universal moral absolutes. And I agree that those are, are imposed upon others. But these are nevertheless subjective. Dude, my opinion is that everybody should always. Your opinion is everybody should always. Every other person that has a universal moral absolute that they hold to believes that everybody always. But that does not make any of those positions objective. They're not objectively true. They are the subjective opinions of those people who hold them. I logical necessity that which is subjective is not a universal moral absolute when you say a universal moral absolute are you saying this universally applicable or are you saying that it exists independent of any person's opinion when we're talking about morale we're talking about as it relates to our world and our people correct now i asked you earlier is it true or is it false it's always wrong for anyone to torture baby's death or merely for one's personal pleasure. You said it's true, which means you believe in a universal moral absolute truth. I said it's true according to the standard that I hold to and according to the standard that other people hold to that is similar or the same as myself. So according to your standard, it's universally true. And according to your standard, there's a universal moral absolute. Yes, one that I hold. Okay. One that, so when it comes from me and one that is shared by Thankfully, okay. the vast majority of others when it comes to the torture of babies and slavery. So, and you also said it was an abstraction, a moral morality is an abstraction. Can you have an abstraction without a mind? No, I don't believe you can, which was what okay. makes, it, makes it subjective instead of objective. Okay. So now what you have is a universal moral absolute truth that is based on a mind. Again, you're talking about you're injecting the word truth and it doesn't belong there. The it, only time it can be considered if it was, truth is if it is compared to a particular standard. That's I asked how if it was true or false. Truth. I asked if it was true or false. You said, yes, it's true, according, according to what you believe. To my standard. So your standard is a completely subjective standard that, that is, is universally true for everybody. No, yeah, so it is not true for everybody. It is true to the standard that I hold. And is your standard the right one? To me, my standard is the right one. Other people may disagree. Society collectively agrees upon what the standard is. I don't is. care about society. We're talking about you. Society holds the, right, that holds the standard that benefits the majority of society. Yeah, and that's circular. Why is it beneficial? Because they agree with it. Why do they agree with it? Because it's beneficial. It doesn't go anywhere. It's a logical problem. But look, you're the one who said that it's a universal moral absolute. That I hold. But it's also a conceptual thing. So you hold then. Your, your opinion is that there is a universal moral abstraction, a single universal moral abstraction that's represented by the statement, it is always wrong to torture babies death merely for one's personal pleasure. So what you're saying is there's a universal, a transcendent universal moral abstraction. Transcendent means it's not dependent upon space and time. Now, not dependent upon space and time means it's transcendent. It's always wrong for everyone. That's independent of space, it's independent of people, it's independent of time, in, in the sense of independent of people, meaning their preferences don't determine its validity. So you're saying that there is a universal, moral, transcendent, absolute, which is an abstraction. Okay, so when you say it's not dependent upon other people for its validity, that is, in a sense, true, but only according to the standard that we are referencing. And that's one that I hold, 
and therefore it is true according to that standard which I hold. But I, you're not, I, you still can't show that, that standard which you're referencing is an objective standard. It's simply I, a standard which I hold and other people hold. I'm taking what, what you said. You said, I said, you said, you. You keep going out all this. I go, you. You said it's always wrong for everyone to torture babies to death merely for their personal pleasure. You said that this is a, a true statement. That means, now we look at the statement, the nature of the statement is that's an abstraction. You said morals are abstractions. And it's also universally true for all, always wrong for everyone. That is what transcendent moral truths are. Now you're saying that you believe in a universal moral transcendent tr truth. So are you saying that my my uh, standard is a universal or is a transcendent um, is a transcendent uh, moral standard no i'm not but i'm saying that you affirm that there is one no i'm not affirming that there is one i am asserting yes, you are. i am i am imputing one to all of society you just said it's I am, always I am wrong the originator of that standard i am the one that holds that standard and i am imposing it upon all society based on how how convicted I am that people ought not to torture babies. So then you said you're the one who originated it, so that means it's biased. Subjective to me, yes. It's biased to you. Yes. Okay. And so you said that which is objective is what's not biased. So you're saying it's just subjective. So your subjective opinion is there's an objective truth. Uh, no, I, I'm not saying that it's an objective truth. You're the one that keeps on saying You just that. did. You just no, did. No, it's always wrong right. for everyone. That's an objective truth. It's, it doesn't depend on our subjectivity. It You're is, saying it's universally applicable. It is dependent upon the standard. Something is dude, only true according to a standard. Dude, you said, you said that there's a universal moral truth because you're the one who said it's always wrong for everyone that's your opinion you believe that statement is true so you're the one saying there's a universal moral truth standard that everyone ought to be based I, on I, your subjective pre preference i'm not saying it's a truth standard at all i'm saying the standard i hold is that yes you are universally absolutely you know immoral. yes you are you are saying it's a universal truth standard by agreeing to the statement no, I'm not saying it's true. Okay, so if there's the standard that I hold, and you say is torturing babies, you know, always. I didn't ask that. It's not that. It's it's it always wrong for everyone. It's always wrong. For That's everyone. the statement. Right. So according to the standard I hold, it is always wrong for everyone. Now I think we're we're just going over this over and over again. I think Matt. We've yeah, we are. Where we're you're, not making any progress. Yeah, we're not because and you're so stuck. I'm, I'm willing so, to just kind of leave it at this and say, Oh, I, no. Well, no, no, no. no. I, I you're really the one, I'm going to show you. You're the one saying it's always wrong for everyone to do a certain thing. You're the one asserting there is a universal moral standard. You're the one saying that based on your subjective opinion. How do you assert subjectively that there's a universal objective truth? Okay, I'm not asserting there's a universal objective truth in that. Yes, sense. you did. No, you I, agreed. I, it's always wrong for everyone to do this. That's a universal objective truth. No, it's not a universal objective truth. It is a position that I hold. It is a subjective position that I hold that everyone should always not torture. Your, your opinion is that there's a universal moral truth because I said it's always wrong for everyone to do this. You said that's correct. You're the one holding to a universal moral truth, which is, by definition, a moral truth is an abstraction, which you said. I'm sorry. I, I, I really got to go. Um, but it's, it's been good talking to you. I'm sorry we, we uh, have not come to an agreement. But thank you again, Andrew, for the uh, chat. Well, okay. come, come back in because I got a whole bunch of questions I wanted to have fun with here. All right. You have a good one. Okay. All right. You too, Matt. Yep. Okay. <laughs> That was classic. That's pretty classic. So on one hand, he affirms a universal moral absolute, but on the other hand, he does not. When he applies his subjective truth to the statement, it's, it's absolutely true, but it's not really absolutely true. But he has an absolute truth 
value to everybody based on his subjective position, which means you can't have a universal truth actually be that. And what they'll do is he does this typically with atheists. It's just my opinion that is true. That it's just your, it also is your opinion that there's a universal moral truth, isn't there? How? You notice he never did do what he said he could do, which was to prove by his standard that one of the two statements, there is or there is not objective morality, that he could prove it. He didn't prove it. But he couldn't. What he, well, yeah, what he did was just by definition, this is how you start. And then you go that way. Well, I, you know, I didn't spend much time on it. How do you know your definition is the right one? He went with the consensus, but that's argument in the populum. Then we get into some more deeper philosophical issues about the nature of what truth is. But he didn't want to go there. But uh, still, we went to with this standard statement I use, and it really tripped him up. It trips them all up. What are they going to do? It, it, it was funny because he's first off begging the question. He wants you to accept yeah. his definition. And, and I was, I, yeah, I was going to do that. Just say, I could prove he's wrong. There's three of us in here. Two of us agree there's objective morality. By his standard, he must accept the majority. Um, I mean, the, the real scary thing, here's the real scary thing wow. with, with this. You end up, this becomes good for folks to see. It's exactly what we actually started the show with. He was a great example of it. That what atheists have to do is redefine all their terms because uh -huh. their arguments are not logically valid so they have to redefine everything to try to fit what they wish was reality. Yeah. So and, I, and that's I, what I, he was I, doing. Ah, oh, yeah. So much heresy, so little time. So he, he, he gave, he gives a definition that, that as you pointed out, his definition is worded so that he can win an argument, but it's, it's not a valid definition. So he, yeah. his definition, well, if we all, if we all accept the definition and, and so what you have is that everyone, as you pointed out, we, we, everyone's just changing definitions to say, well, what's an atheist? An atheist is someone who lacks belief. And I love what you, yeah. you do. You'll, oh, this is an atheist. My mouse is an atheist. Yeah. You know, this pen is an atheist. It lacks belief. I mean, it's, it's, they, they end up on poor definitions. But they can't be precise because their arguments are invalid. Gosh. Um, it was pretty bad. It, there's I mean, the scary thing with this, and what you see with the atheists, is that what he was ultimately appealing to is majority rule and might makes right. And that's where it gets scary because this is when you get this as a government, that's what ends up happening. Um, you know, that's that question I pose, I framed for my debate with Dan Barker. It's always wrong for anyone to torture babies to death merely for their personal pleasure. This is the inconsistency of the universe of the atheist position who says all morality is subjective. How can you then from your subjective opinion say all morality really is subjective? How can you then say, but it's universally applicable to everybody? That's by definition is not what subjectivity is. And this was the problem he was having. He could not grasp that. He's playing a word game with himself in order to, uh, to work. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, the standard for definitions is called a dictionary. Yeah. <laughs> not not yourself <laughs> yeah i mean that's that's really what it comes down to yeah the, well, well i illustrated it true when he said well, you know, it, it, basically the definitions whatever standard you want whatever the subjectivity of it i started behaving in a manner consistent with his statement and uh, was trying to illustrate the problem with it but you don't have proper definitions you can't work with anything and and i didn't see his definition in the dictionary that he said go to go to webster's it wasn't there but he had tried to interpret part of it to mean that and you know it, and and then what did he want to do he wanted to appeal to everybody yeah right? appeal, appeal to the majority yeah so so here's a, a simple this is uh, let's make this really simple for for folks if you're going to try to argue this way that it's the majority then we should not in america be trying to change any laws for same-sex marriage we shouldn't have been changing them for abortion because the majority right. was against it. That's that right. was the majority's morality. And so you should not be pushing to change any of those laws. You should be submitting to the but, majority. But he said he has the right to try and change the opinions of everybody else because it's his right to do so, which is another topic. Why is it your right to do so? What gives you the right to say that it's your right? Because everything is subjective. And I tried to show him your subjectivity is nothing but self-refutation. 
<clears throat> but see, as you gave with the one example with the with the you know, I think it was the the case of of rape or you know the raping the children. The issue is is that what he ends up doing is he says even if he if, and if he's the only one that held that because of his standard he would try to force it on others. Yeah. And yeah, so he therefore free. he's not yeah. submitting to the majority. He it's the majority in in his definition should be what's true and you know take this on the streets for police officers. He mentions the police. I mean put that on the street for police officers. How in the world by what standard are they going to judge? That yeah. they yeah. whatever the all if all the police agree that that makes it right. Yeah. You, you you cannot you cannot govern by this kind of thinking and this is why atheism when it whenever it gets into trying to govern always fails it leads to death Be yeah always leads to death yeah murder and death yeah. Th th this is this is the problem is you know look even if you try to argue as he was saying that he has he has the right to change people's opinion okay but that's not how we see that change going on in culture why trying would to he say that we should go with the consensus definition of things yeah. he's Contradicting himself, because the, because the the definition is changing. Therefore, it's he's, not consensus anymore. It's them changing the definition. If he's so, going to be consistent, he should always work to keep the status quo. Yeah, that's that's true. All right, so uh, wow. I think uh, John was the next one in. Wait, I'm going to get some. Uh, yeah, I'm going to do before we before bring John in. Is I'm going to play a quick commercial. So many Christians struggle with suffering, and yet they do it alone because most of us are too ashamed to let others know that we're struggling. We struggle alone because we think that there's something wrong. As Christians, we shouldn't be struggling at all. We should just have the answers, and yet that's not the case. There's many of us who struggle, whether it be within our marriage, whether it be with our children, whether it be with physical ailments. I want to let you know of a conference coming to Freehold, New Jersey, to help with this. It is called the Sanctification Through Suffering Conference. It is going to be held at Chinese American Bible Church in Freehold, New Jersey. You can get all the information and the speakers. The speakers will be Justin Peters, who if you know him, you know he struggles physically. Frank Mullis, Colleen Sharp, and Joe Suazo. And we will have this conference. You can get all the details and register at strivingforeternity.org slash conference dash on dash suffering. Get all the details and I hope to see you there. All right. So that's the conference we are going to be doing, dealing with the topic of suffering, both uh, dealing with anxiety, depression, physical things. And I uh, just got word this past weekend that uh, Pastor Mullis will be doing a session on suffering through persecution, uh, being that, as we were just discussing, that's something that's going to end up coming for Christians. Uh, reality is, is the, the thinking that we just got a, an hour of, uh, as that prevails, death yeah. always follows that. Um, I'll also let you folks know, you know, one thing that can help with dealing with suffering is a good night's sleep. How can you help to get a good night's sleep? Well, one way that I do it, and so does Matt, is we use my pillow. My pillow is a supporter, a sponsor of the show here. And so if you want to get yourself a good night's sleep, get yourself a my pillow. You can call 1 800 944 5396. That's 1 800 944 5396. Let them know that you heard it on Apologetics Live. And so we, Matt and I both love our my pillows. We both travel with them because they are that comfortable. I've had mine for many years, and it hasn't gotten any softer. So uh, Matt can still hear you, John. I've unmuted or I've added you in. If you want to unmute yourself, I don't know what questions you might have. Do babies exist? <laughs> 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 I mean, seriously, this guy, I wanted to go and go hostile on this guy. I, I, I mean, come on. I mean, really? I mean, he, 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 he makes these claims, right? That you know, he's, you know, he, he only lives by subjective standards. I guarantee if he tried to have that 
consistent worldview, inconsistent worldview, I should say, in a bank. If he says, hey, I I feel that I have $10,000 in my account, they're going to go, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's just ridiculous how they think that, you know, there's no such thing as objective morality. I mean, it's 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 retarded. I just I just cannot believe how frustrating that conversation was. <laughs> Almost, you know, since you asked the question, Matt, we should play the clip <laughs> that that comes from. Oh, so okay. this is what sparked that question. Here we go. You said statements either are true or false. I gave you a statement, and you said it doesn't apply. It's not true. It's not so a, only two that statements would be either true or false. So is it true that I'm talking to you? Is it true? That is true statement. I'm talking to you. Is that true? Yes. Okay. Is it true that babies exist? Um, well, I mean, how babies how exist, you down the babies, exist. Is, babies exist. Is that true or is it not the case that it's true? Uh, I would, I mean, if you want to go down the, you know, if you want to be very strict about it, I would be uh, skeptical about it. Okay, we're done talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We, we have on, a longer clip where John extent. lost it. We can play that. <laughs> oh, hey, let me, let me give a quick shout out. We just got, a, and I forget what it's called when folks give, uh, donate to the show in the middle of the show. Super chat. Um, what is it? Super chat. Super chat. That's right. So we got a two dollar super chat from Henry Rodriguez. Yeah. Um, so thank you for that. All right. <laughs> so I All guess right. John's question for you, Matt, is: Do babies exist? <laughs> yes. Next. Hey, my my question is: How do I become a super chatter so I can do that too? I'm do not sure. I, I think there's an IQ it, uh, limit, so I don't know if you can make it. <laughs> oh, I don't qualify. <laughs> when you're watching on YouTube, uh, there is a way to, it. there's a little cash button. And you can, if you look down, you'll see the little smiley face. You also see a little cash, like a dollar sign, and you can click on that. And it, that? that's a super chat. Oh, and, I found it right below and, my chat line. Uh, yes. Yeah. And so what you do is, cool. if you like what you're hearing, if you're enjoying oh. the conversation, you can shoot off a dollar or two or three or four, whatever you want, and uh, and that will basically uh, get that over, and we'll we'll announce. Like Jason Manning just uh, gave two dollars, saying babies exist! <laughs> Exclamation! <laughs> point. Hallelujah! <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, let's. Hey, do, we should have a T-shirt. Babies exist. Got it. <laughs> you need a T-shirt. Okay. If if we can get twenty dollars in super chats, we'll play John losing it over the babies exist. <laughs> One of oh, the funniest cool. clips ever. <laughs> we'll do that. How's that? All right. Tyler, let's really? See, who is I would I would love to have his thoughts on that whole thing with uh the uh, atheist. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. Well, it was, right, you know, add... for me, it was a little bit, a little bit of practice. We'll see how this guy's thinking, see if there's anything new. But it all comes back down to the same issue of, of subjectivity. But notice what happened. When I started telling him about the transcendental nature of the statement that he was talking about, and it was a universal abstraction, he didn't know what to do at that point. And then his phone started going off conveniently, and he had to leave. So I don't know. The next, so next up is Andrew. He was the next one in, so Andrew, you can unmute yourself and uh, ask your question from down under. Uh, thanks, guys. Sorry, I got a hey. call going in the background. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for uh, helping me out uh, about two weeks ago, um, getting me out of the thing. Um, got back in the church and felt a lot better. That's basically all I wanted good. to say. Well, good for you. Well, it's good. I mean, what, what Matt and I pray before we start this each week is that uh, this would be a blessing to uh, specifically to believers like yourself, that some of the things that we teach would be helpful. And then we pray for the unbelievers that they would come to know Christ. Yeah, that's the tough part. Trying to talk to my brother Ed do, about anything to do with religion is... Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> That's the tougher part. So I, I've ended up having to pray, and that's about all I got left. 
Well, good for you, man. Good for you. I think it had to do with subjectivity, a little bit of feelings, some other stuff, pointers you just trust yeah. in God and things like that. That's right. Yeah, and the church is going through changes, which we still yeah. got to have our meeting to get the committee, committee to find the new pastor, that sort of thing. So it's... it's Well, have, have them uh, fly me down. I'll preach for a couple of weeks and then they'll have plenty <laughs> to clean up afterwards. Yeah, I, I'm sure they'll. I'm sure they'll enjoy it. Um, Dan, Dan will enjoy it again. <laughs> You'd enjoy it. I don't know if anybody else would. Uh, yeah, no, we've we've discussed you at length. I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he knows he didn't say, but it was good. He didn't. We discussed you. We didn't, we didn't say it was good though. <laughs> no, he just mentioned that he knew you and he said you're a little bit odd and I kind of went, yeah, you know what, I think that's because of Asperger's comes in on it. That's my yeah, thought. Yeah, it does. <laughs> but there are advantages and disadvantages to everything, so. Hey, oh, of course there are. There. That's right. Yeah, very slick. That's right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Anyway. Matt, Matt's not so slick enough. I've, I have proven that Matt's not slick enough. No, no, no. You're just sneakier than me, but I'm totally <laughs> slick. Ah. All right. So it right, looks so, like uh, Perez wants to go, so let him go. I'll mute. Well, yeah. he's. We, we go in order, and I'll give a shout-out. I see Skylar Fiction in the watching, so give a shout-out to him. We had a good show together some time ago. We may do another, hopefully, talking about uh, Islam, but uh, I've brought in... Catholic traditionalist, you can unmute yourself. And so what questions do you have for Matt? Uh, let's check his volume. Your volume's up. There we go. Coming in loud now and clear now. Now we're yeah. hearing. Okay, let me, let me plug this back in again, because if I don't, you might hear the uh, other volume. Let me try this again. Hold on. Okay, can you still hear me? Am I coming in? Yeah, you yeah. actually sounded better before. Oh, I did? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, but okay, well. We can hear you. Go for it. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think you're very good at debating atheists, Matt. <clears throat> I remember when you go into Pal Talk and you go into those atheist rooms and you get them all riled up. But I noticed that the atheists, they all use that same tactic, you know, with these logic arguments that's presented. and um, you know, they try to work around it. Uh, so I called in, it was last year, I called into uh, that Atheist Experience show, and I spoke to Matt Dillahunty, and I took a different approach. I figured, okay, well, let me get him to admit that through supernatural uh, miracles, the credibility of God, he's more, it's more credible that a God exists rather than a God not existing. And so I asked him the question, I said, um, if Jesus snapped his fingers and made the entire universe disappear with, with the exception of, you know, the earth and the solar system, then would you say that it is more credible that God does exist versus him snapping his fingers and nothing happening? And I got him to say yes. After doing that, I said, okay. So we have a miracle, supernatural miracle attributed to God that you said, you know, validates, you know, makes it more credible that this God does exist, this God of the Bible. So therefore we have miracles that actually do exist. And I, as I was, and <laughs> I guess he knew what I was about to say since he knew I was a Catholic. I said I was a Catholic, you know, when I called in. So I started, you know, speaking about Fatima and the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe, the miracle of Lanciano. And I started going into all the different miracles attributed to God. So he hung up on me. So he knew where I was going with it. So how do you know that? But I, I think how do I know that they're from God? Yeah. Well, it's that's just it. He would have asked the same question. They're well, already I'm attributed. You, how do you know they're from God? Well, that's well, that's just it. They're already attributed to God through the church. And not only that, it. but also the shroud, not only that, but also the shroud of Turin. I don't know what your thoughts are on the shroud of Turin. Um, how do you know that the you know the apparitions of Mary or you know Fatima, for example? You, how do you know it's really Mar Mary? Well, and I believe that it's Mary, based on because the Sorry. church, yeah, because yeah, because the church said that it's worthy of belief that 
and and they they go ahead and they study this stuff, they look into it, and there are many apparitions that they don't approve uh, because there are apparitions that are demonic that Satan goes ahead and he tries to represent himself as the Blessed Virgin Mary, such as uh, the uh, apparition of Medjugorje, which is happening right now in uh, Croatia. And so you know that these these are demonic uh, apparitions because whenever an apparition, like for example, in Medjugorje, it said that God is happy with all religions, that he believes all religions are good. Well, that's simply false. Even a Protestant would say that's false. How do you because, know it's false? Because God would not say that Islam is good. How do you know that? God, God would not say that. God, God would not say that any pagan religion is good Where because is we know the very first commandment of God is against false religions. So, scripture. So, it, so, the, so the apparition said the exact opposite of what God said in the Bible. So, so you're saying that you would judge the truth of an apparition by the word of God, scripture? Yes, or by scripture and by Catholic infallible teaching, which coincides with scripture. Yeah, right. So uh, how about this? This is Fatima, uh, May, 7, uh, May 13th, 1917. This, uh, this apparition says, uh, there's three quotes here I want to get to. Are you willing to offer yourselves to God to bear all the sufferings he wants to send you as an act of reparation for the sin by which he's offended and by the conversion of sinners? So they're supposed to make reparation for the sins. I thought Jesus made reparation for our sins. Well, you do know that Jesus didn't take all the penalty for our sins when he died on the cross. You do realize that, don't you? Yeah. Okay, so the reparations is in regards to that, those penalties. It's not talking about penalties with regards to salvation. It's talking about temporal penalties and penalties with regards to purgatory. So this reparation for the sin which he's offended. Okay. Correct. All right. So you're saying that what that really is, is it's nothing to do with atonement. It's about they have to make themselves right with God because he's offended by them. So they got to make it right. Yeah, that's, that's, for example, uh, a person doesn't go to heaven if they're still in sin. No one can get into heaven if they have sin on their soul. Uh, okay. Now, if one, if one doesn't have mortal sin, but still has sin, then they have to go to purgatory uh, for a certain amount of time. And they're purged from that sin. They're made right with God with regards to being purged from that sin. And for example, for example, um, you know, I've, I've heard Protestants say before that, well, Jesus took all our penalty for our sins upon himself on the cross. Well, that's simply not true because one of the penalties was physical death. Another penalty was the pains of labor for women when they're giving childbirth. Another one is simply physical suffering. All of these things are because of sin. Therefore, we, we're still experiencing, you know, physical death. Women are still experiencing labor pains. So the fact of the matter is we're still in a world whereby the penalties for sin still exist. Okay, so you're saying it's okay then that these children uh, offered themselves uh, to as reparation for the sins by which God himself is offended. You say that that's not a problem. Yeah, that's not a problem. When you go ahead and you pray for someone and you're doing uh, uh for example, you're doing something. Uh, well, let me ask you this. Is it beneficial for any Christian to pray for another Christian? I don't know what you mean by beneficial for. It's not clear. Well, I, well, if you pray to God uh, on behalf of another Christian uh, that, you know, let's say for that Christian's uh, uh, child to get healed. Let's say the child is uh, sickly and God answers your prayers. And let's say you even fast. And, uh, you know, for this to happen, is this biblical? Is this something that's biblical? Fasting biblical. and prayer. It's biblical to pray and to fast. Okay. So, so if you have these children of Fatima praying and fasting for someone, for another Christian, so that that, that Christian and then their family does not, uh, embark on some sort of punishment due to a sinful world that we live in. Would that be ben Would that be a? Would, obviously, that would be biblical then. Yeah, you're, you're interchanging biblical and beneficial. Uh, there are certain biblical things to you know to pray, but the quote I gave you, um, 
are you willing to offer yourselves to God to bear all the sufferings? You wait, guys. There's there's two more quotes that are really good. Uh, to offer yourself to God uh, to bear all the sufferings he wants to send you as an act of reparation for the sins by which he's offended. So when we lie, we've offended God. So their suffering is for is for reparation. What that means, to re it, reparation means to repair, to make it right. So their suffering makes things right mm -hmm. uh, before God. That's right. Correct. Yeah. For example, uh, let's say, Jesus. for example, that's heresy. Well, that's well, yeah, for example, no, 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 no. Well, let me explain. For example, let's say, um, let's say uh, a child, they're, they're, ta uh, they're taking, uh, the father says, uh, get me some orange juice out of the refrigerator. The child gets the orange juice. The child is purposely careless with the orange juice and accidentally uh, spills it. But it didn't have to happen because the child could have been cautious with it, but it happened anyway. And, and we have orange juice all over on the floor. So, the child is actually sorry for what they've done. And because the child is sorry for what they've done, the father forgives the child. So this, this is what took place with regards to Jesus. He, he forgave us of our sins. So the child is right with the father. Now, would you, do you believe that the child at this point should clean up the orange juice or leave it on the floor? Guy, you're way off topic here. Uh, I'm just, I'm just saying that what the quote says, what this apparition says, is that by their well, sufferings, yeah. they're going to make things right uh, before right. God. Right, and that's what I'm trying on, to explain to you. Based on their I'm sins against God, and the biblical position mm -hmm. is that Jesus Christ is the one who did that. Let me read this second quote. Um, well, hold on. on. Let's. Well, hold on. Let's let's focus on the first one because uh, you 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 pointed out because uh, we're not finished with that. Do you think that the child should clean up the orange juice on the floor or just now the child is already forgiven, okay. but should the child leave the orange juice on the floor? Sure. He should clean up uh, the orange juice. Yeah, he should. Okay. So then that answers your question. There it are does. things that must be repaired. Cleaning, right. Cleaning orange juice off the floor mean that their suffering, these children's suffering actually fixes the sins that have offended God. Because it was an, it was the sin of being, careless with the orange juice that caused the orange juice to end up on the floor in the first place. Their sins against God. So therefore, God. So so they, therefore they, they make it, they make their, by, by their suffering, they make things right before God. What by their sins? Notice what it says as an act of reparation for the sins by which he's offended. Our sins against God are repaired by their suffering. Okay, Matt, we're going to go on to, you know, comparing Jesus to a child. We're not doing that here. <laughs> Let's move on to your second quote. Let's move on to the second quote. I want to do that. But what he's saying is ridiculous. Jesus wants to use you. It just what always gets me. The apparition says, Jesus wants to use you to make me known and loved. He wishes to establish a devotion to my immaculate heart throughout the world. I promise salvation to whoever embraces it. Okay. Well, just to, okay. just to answer Andrew, Andrew said that I was comparing Jesus to a child. I never compared the child to Jesus. I was comparing the father to Jesus. The father was the one who forgave the child. Okay, so um, so anyway, yeah. With regards to that, if you have a devotion to the to the Blessed Virgin Mary, she always points to Jesus. It, you're not giving the whole story because throughout yes, Jesus. That, well, let me read it again. Okay. Jesus wants to use you to make me known and loved. He wishes to establish a devotion to my immaculate heart throughout the whole world. I promise salvation to whoever embraces it. That's what the apparition says. So salvation is promised okay. by the apparition to those who have devotion to whatever it is, the immaculate heart of Mary. If you have devotion to the immaculate heart of Mary, the apparition promises salvation. And is that did she okay throughout the she gave several different messages several different months. Now, did you look? Did you read all those other messages? Because she's uh, constantly speaking years about ago, years ago. I read a lot of them. Uh, what about this? Okay. So what is it? Tell me seriously. I, I don't. In all seriousness, I don't understand. What is the immaculate heart of, of Mary? I don't understand what that is. Okay. Well, the the heart refers to love. Uh, the the the. Uh, Immaculate Heart of Mary, it, it refers to her when she was conceived. She wasn't conceived in sin like you and I or anyone else. She was born without any uh, original oh, sin. Oh, she's sinless. Correct. Okay. And uh, also, so the thing is, well, hold on, Matt. You asked me a question. I, I'd like to answer your original question. 
because you said that she's pointing to herself. Well, that's not true. If you would have read all the other messages, along with that same message, because you're only taking one little part, she's constantly speaking about Jesus and that they, they're to look to Jesus and that go, going through her, that they can go through her as an intercessor to Jesus, which is in biblical. In, intercession is biblical. Um, and I don't know why Protestants deny that. Uh, just like the example, we didn't say intercession is not biblical. You said going to Mary to get to Jesus. That's not biblical. And you, you, uh, well, what you did was well, you just bastardized well, the whole concept, two concepts here. You bastardized them. Let me tell you something. When you say it's biblical to, to intercede and you have to go to Mary to go to Jesus, those are different things. To intercede, <clears throat> you know, if I pray for you and your salvation, what you desperately need, and I pray for your salvation, I'm not going to ask Mary to do it. I'm going to go to Jesus to do it. See, what you do is you equivocate. You you Catholics do this all the time. You change the meaning. You say one thing over here, and then you drive a truckload of her heresy through it. What the but Matt, you're, you're not understanding. Oh, you're not understanding. You just I don't understand. Look, Jesus Look. wants use wants to use you to make me known in love. Really, the Holy Spirit bears witness of Jesus. The Scriptures bear witness of Jesus. The prophets bear witness of Jesus. The Father bears witness of Jesus. The prophecies <laughs> of the Old Testament bear witness of Jesus. Jesus bears witness of Himself. But this is I what agree. I absolutely says. agree. Jesus I wants to you. use you to make me know. Jesus wants to make Mary known. Show me that in Scripture. Okay. Well, you just admitted that you can act as an intercessor by praying for me or anyone else. So that can Mary like act as Mary? So can so can Mary act as an intercessor? I don't know. Well, she admitted that. Well, well, she admitted. Well, well, well hold, she admitted, hold on. Let, let's be specific because you got category errors all over the place. He does. This is not praying for someone the way that you're using it. That's right. Okay. This is being a mediator, which scripture is kind of clear. There's no mediator between God and man, except who? Not Mary. That's the way it's being used. So use it properly and then find the scripture that denies what scripture says. Okay. Well, Show Andrew, actually. Me mediator. Okay. Okay. Well, actually, Jesus is the ultimate media mediator between us and the Father. He but the ultimate. Ultimate. He's the only mediator. There's okay. one meaning. Yeah. It doesn't say ultimate. You keep changing yeah. the word of God to make it fit what you want. The, okay. This guy, seriously, man, okay. the, this guy, this and I constantly started to watch that he's now arguing just like the previous atheist, and he doesn't oh, even yeah, see it. He yeah, he is. Let me let me go to this quote because look, this is the, the point. Jesus apparently says in the apparition, he Jesus wishes to establish devotion to my immaculate heart throughout the world. No, he doesn't. You cannot find that in scripture. And then the, the apparition says, I promise salvation to whoever embraces the devotion to Mary. Where's that in scripture? It is not there. Here's the third quote. Everybody needs to know these things. Sacrifice yourselves for sinners and say often to Jesus, especially whenever you make a sacrifice. Oh, Jesus, it is the, for the love of thee, for the conversion of sinners and in reparation for the sins committed against the immaculate heart of Mary. Now. Not only we have sins against God, but now the apparition says, now you have sins against Mary. Really? This, it's, this is elevating a demonic manifestation to official acceptance. The demonic manifestation is very obvious. And the reason we know it's obvious is because we go with what the scripture says. We know that we cannot make any reparation for the sins by which God is offended. We cannot, which is why Jesus did it. He bore our sin on his body on the cross, 1 Peter 2, 24. He made reparation for the sins by which God is offended. We know that Jesus wants us to come to him. He says everyone should come to him, Matthew eleven twenty. Eight. He says, come to me, you are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He doesn't say go to Mary. He never says go to Mary. He would never say that uh, he wants to establish the devotion to the immaculate heart of Mary and that this apparition would then approve or God would approve of the apparition saying that the apparition promises salvation. Whoever embraces devotion to the immaculate heart of Mary and nor would Jesus ever say sacrifice yourselves. Uh, for the conversion of sinners so that you can make it right with the sins you've committed against Mary. We, this is just idolatry. And the fact that you as a Roman Catholic cannot see this is just evidence of your unregeneration, your blinded, your bondage, 
and that you are on your way to eternal damnation because you are lost. Okay, well, what she means by that is uh, she doesn't mean about sins as in she's not comparing those sins to the sins that you commit against God. She's speaking of sins with regards to offenses. For example, if you, Say, you Matt Slick, said, was to... Separation for the sins committed against the Immaculate Heart of Mary. You keep changing what it actually says to make it fit. You're backpedaling. No, I'm just going by what you just said. We both agree that sins... Actual sins are committed against God. So therefore, when she's speaking about sins, she's not speaking about sins against a deity, which is God, the one deity. She's speaking about offenses against her because there are many offenses against her by many Protestants. For they don't respect her like we Catholics respect her. Uh, they show it's actually just, disrespect. It's an of, of your Catholic value is not found in Scripture. So it's a meaningless statement to us. We want Scripture. And also those that actually uh, compiled the books of Scripture, if you look at their writings, they spoke very highly of the Blessed Virgin Mary, whereas we don't see that with Protestants. We see them well, one of the reasons you don't see it among Bethlehem. Protestants is because of the reactionary against the reaction against the idolatry that is committed by the Roman Catholic Church. We don't want to aid and abed the enemy of the gospel in that process. <laughs> Well, it's not idolatry because we don't worship the Blessed Virgin Mary. We only worship the Holy Trinity. Um, well, actually, it's idolatry what you do. No. Yes, it but is. Um, the thing is, even... Why even don't you, don't you ask me how I know that? Yeah, well, even if we disagree on uh, Fatima, uh, the thing is, you uh, it's still... Still, with regards to Matt Dillahunty, uh, it still would approve something with regards to the supernatural. And that's what I was getting at, because he admitted that uh, in my previous question to him, that it is more credible, you know, because of a, a supernatural event taking place. And that's what I was getting at. And I, I think your approach is very good. It's, you know, it's, a, it's one type of approach. But I think bringing up the miracles of God, for example, what's your thoughts on the Shroud of Turin? I haven't uh, an opinion on it. Okay. So, okay. so here's the thing, because we got some other folks to, to come in. Um, you know, we got someone who's been dying to get in here quite quite impatiently. So Let's I want to save his sure life so he doesn't die. Yeah, we don't, I don't want him to die here on us. Uh, so I want to make sure he come comes in. Um, I, I just I I'll say for, uh, um, you know, I do appreciate that um, you did exactly like I thought. You did argue exactly like the atheist did you're redefining things and putting the same thing so you really shouldn't criticize them all right but i'm going to bring in uh let's see his name is o perez let's see let me sh bring him in you should be able to unmute yourself as long as it's not josh smith <laughs> yeah i know he's here can you hear me yes we can shallow Wong. so we got about 20 minutes left, so go for it. Now, now before we talk about the my main topic. Well, you, you have 20 minutes, so don't better make it quick. That, that Catholic was wrong. Yeah, I agree he was wrong. I, so what, you're an atheist, right? No. What are I'm you? I'm an Israelite. Okay. All Wait. right. You're an, you're an Israelite like I am? No, no, wait, you're not an Israelite. I'm from the Israelite. Israelite. Are you BHI? Yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. Are you BHI? Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. okay so you're a black Hebrew Israelite. Okay, go for it. I'm from the tribe of Issachar. Okay. But, so these Catholics never read Second Ephesians. Where it says Jesus is the cornerstone, not Peter. Second Ephesians? Yeah. I think it means Ephesians. No, Ephesians 2. Where's Second Ephesians? No, Ephesians chapter 2. Oh, oh, Ephesians 2. Okay. Jesus is the cornerstone. Okay, so what you said you what you're dying to talk to me? Uh, did you want to ask me something? So let's go to Daniel 7:9. Daniel 7, 9. Okay, what about Daniel 7, 9? 
I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the ancient days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool, his throne like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. So you know who that's talking about? Uh, ancient days probably is Christ, but uh, not exactly sure. It's been a long time since I've talked about it, but go ahead. God has woolly hair. Woolly hair. Oh. And oh, okay. is Adam Fox commentary. So he has woolly hair, so that means God is a black guy? Yes. So we're talking about God here. Is this God the Father? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so God the Father has a body of flesh and bones? Wait. No, but wait, wait, let's let's read the, the wait, commentary wait, 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 of Adam Clark. Wait, 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 no, 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 no. Let's go to the text. Um, so he has woolly hair. Does does he have a head? You said it his wall. That's his hair. Well, 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 so, well, this is a spiritual entity we're talking. Well, wait, 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 wait. You know, because it does say head, the hair of his head was like pure wool. So you're using this to I guess wool is kind of curly, so black hair is kind of curly. So you say he's a black guy. That's what you said. And uh, so he has a head, right? So you're saying God has a head. He has a body. Of, doesn't he? he? has a body, right? That's why I wanted to read to you Adam Clark's commentary. I don't want to hear Adam Clark's commentary. I'm talking to you. So you're saying that God has a body of flesh and bones or flesh and blood, right? Do you know more than Adam Clark? I'm asking you the question. Are you saying that God... It has a body of flesh and bones. Well, no. Then why would you appeal to the issue of hair on God to support the black stuff? Well, I don't understand. Wait, that's why I wanted to read that. I'm not interested in, in, in that. I'm interested in what you think the text means. You're the one who brought this text up, Daniel 7, 9. You're the one who brought up the issue of the wall, implying, uh, I, I don't know what the right... about, you know, how, how much I? Could have been talking about what? About how was I? Who, who's that? Yeah, how was I? Is that a department by his name. What is it? Oh, okay. Who are you talking about? Who are you talking about? Seriously. And this is the only place in the sacred writings where God the Father is represented in a human form. Adam Clark said that. Can you, can you, uh, please, this word that you used, what is that in reference to? How much, what, what, how much, what, what was it? Yeah, Yahah was shy. Okay, who is that? Or what is that? The son of Yah. What language is that? Hold on. Hold on. So wait, so it's a I'm not son a troll, Joe Smith. Okay, hold on, hold on. So, Yahamasha, whatever. That's the son of who? Yah. Uh, uh, and who's Yah? God. So it's the son of God. Is he the literal son of God? So God had sex with the, so a woman and made Jesus. Is, is that you're not saying that, are you? The begotten son of God through the Holy Spirit. Okay, so it's not a literal thing. Okay, so you think that this head wool refers to Jesus? It could read Revelations one fourteen. So you're you're saying it refers to Jesus, right? Yeah. Okay. Wow. Uh, so wool is is white, right? Yeah, but look how look how tight and curly wool is. As yeah, opposed it's, to like it, it's it's white. And so, do you know any it, black people have white hair like that? Well, if they're old or elderly. Oh, okay. They're older. So Jesus here is an elderly person, even though he died at 33 years of age and it wouldn't have happened to him. So that's what you mean? So why are Revelations 1.14 did it say his hair was white like wool and his feet like burnt bronze? Well, obviously, because he's Caucasian, right? Yeah. I mean, my hair's curly. Yeah, okay, because I'm but Jewish. it's not tight. It's oh, not, so it has to be tight hair. Oh, so now Jesus, it has to be black. Look at a sheep's hair. It's tight. And it's also white. Okay. So, but Jesus was not old, so he died before, he, you know, he got old. So but his hair wouldn't. Young Caucasians have white hair. So he would not have been white. So, um, so you're saying Jesus is a black guy? Okay, let me ask you a question. Uh, I'm a white guy. Uh, am I of the devil? Yeah, you descend from Isa. Okay. And the tribe so, of Magog. Okay, so I'm I'm of the devil, right? And so that means 
I'm am I possessed or or uh, I'm evil in my nature or, or uh, you know is that what it means? What does it mean? Well, in uh, Romans nine thirteen, as God said, I loved Jacob and I hated Esau. Okay, so I'm a white guy, uh, and you say I, I'm 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 evil, uh, you know, demonic. You're descended from Esau. Okay, and uh, so I'm descended from Esau. Okay, and what does that mean? It means I'm going to hell because I'm white. It means you are Edomite. You are a cursed race. Does it mean that I'm going to hell because I'm white? Well, you Does ain't getting mean, saved by Yahweh Shai. Does it mean I'm going to hell because I'm white? Yes, but, okay. but wait, wait, wait. Let's talk. Okay, oh, I hell just yeah. How big of a racist you were? How big of a of a hate filled racist you are? Wait, wait, wait. Oh, oh hell is you. You heaven is you. You judge someone's worth by the color of their skin. Man, what? That is just so racist of you. Yeah, I think Satan has got you. I think Satan has really deceived you. Satan obviously is speaking through you. You don't even know it. And the reason I know it is because you say things that are unbiblical. You say things that are sinful as though they're true. I'll be right back. Where are you going to go? We, we don't have much time. Andrew wants right, a piece so of you. <laughs> All right, so... so yeah. <laughs> While he's gone, let, let me explain how we know someone's from a certain genealogy. We know it because you go from their father to their father to their father to their father. That's how you figure out a genealogy. Um, the argument, and for folks just to think about this logically, just a, a small bit of logic, the argument would be that the... <laughs> The whole argument is that the slaves were the, the Hebrews and that they took them. Um, they basically knew which ones were the Hebrews and took them to America and uh, the islands. Now, think about this just logically. Do you really think slave traders were concerned about trying to keep so, there, so that all the tribes of Judah would be in one? area and all the the different tribes in different areas as they kidnap them follow that on with the fact that how in the world do you get a brother and a sister i'm back both a brother and sister one being kidnapped or and the other not so one would be an israelite the other wouldn't be but but here's the here's a great verse i'm, I'm gonna back prove, i said prove that okay do you know that you if you're right that Jesus must be in hell. Do you know that? Why? Why do you say that? Because Mark chapter 9 says Jesus is white. His he and his remnant became shining exceedingly white as snow so that no fuller on earth can white them. He oh, wait, so the context white of white is that, pure. Pure, huh? not a color, just white means pure. Just like the Nazarene to appear. So this is the thing. Pure. You cannot interpret the scripture the way the rules of interpretation That's are. That's what you're doing. You uh, okay, white means white. Now, what in this text would show that white doesn't mean white when he gives two things? One, he compares it to snow, which is considered white. Two, he considers it to a fuller. Do you know what a fuller is? A what? A fuller. <laughs> Do you know what it is? A fuller? Yeah. Okay, so I'll say you wait, don't. Wait, wait, wait. Let's a, talk, though. A fuller would be a cleaner, so a, a draw, like, a, like a, a laundromat person. They would bleach things. So it is so white that no fuller, no cleaner on earth can white them. He's so white that there's no way to get him whiter. So this what is that here. You are white. misinterpreting the context. I'm reading the context. You're lying devil. I didn't, I didn't change the word white. You did that. Okay. It says he's exceedingly white as snow. He's exceedingly Not pale. Here. Exceedingly white as snow he's so that no four on earth can white them. That's how white he is. So if you're right, then Jesus would have to be in hell. 
Okay, let, I'll show you why you can't be saved. I, well, I just showed you why you believe Jesus can't be saved. You believe God You're lying, because that means he's pure, and I ain't going to argue anymore. Let's... <laughs> Listen, the reality is you have no proof that you're an Israelite. You cannot trace your line back to Abraham. You have to misinterpret a passage of Scripture in Deuteronomy. I have a debate on, on the Striving for Training YouTube channel with the Black Hebrew Israelites. Who else the prophecies? There is no way that you can read Deuteronomy in context and argue that that is the African slave trade. It's in wait, 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 wait. Who else was almost swept up by disease? The natives. What are you talking about? It said it said they would be wiped out, almost swept out by disease and, re and reduced in small numbers. That's what it said in what, De Deuteronomy twenty eight fifty nine. Deuteronomy, what which verse? Twenty eight fifty nine to sixty two. And that so, applies to the Native Americans. Huh? That applies to the natives. It does. Yes. So you think that this this is the Native Americans here in America? Yes, they're that Israelites too. The, what? Well, well, verse 68, and the Lord well, well, shall Egypt bring them into Egypt. Egypt ain't literal. Huh? Egypt ain't literal. Oh, it means okay. America. So Egypt's not literal. Okay, Egypt's not literal. Okay, and, and again with ships, is ships literal? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Then Egypt's literal. Okay. No, no, so, wait, wait, wait. Oh, Egypt oh, the is symbolization for America, just like Babylon. Oh, that's a symbol. Okay, what do the ships symbolize then? Slavery. The ships the ships represent slavery. Yeah. Why? Where do we ever see ships representing slavery? The transatlantic slave trade. Yeah, that's not in the Bible. You, you see, here's the thing. Here's the thing, Perez. You, you're so you don't even realize that you're supposed to say Egypt it represents the slave trade. You're you're not even a good. You you haven't been brainwashed enough to even realize which words you're supposed. I'm an to Israelite apologetic. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, <laughs> dude. Listen, simple. You you. So let's talk context. You cannot take a word and say, well, because this fits my predefined definition, the word Egypt is figurative, but the word ship is literal because I want it to be. Okay. The verse says, and the Lord shall bring them. Bring wait, 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 wait. Why did, why, wait, 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 wait. Well, let's read the verse. And the Lord shall bring them into Egypt again. Talk to the hand, again, devil. By ships. And the way. Thou shalt see it no more again, and there shall be, and they, and there ye shall be sold unto your enemies for bondsmen and bondswomen, and man shall buy you. So this is impossible to be the African slave trade because there were buyers for those slaves. They didn't sell themselves into slavery. As happened when the when the Jewish people that fled the Assyrian and Bab Babylonian captivity, as they fled by ship into Egypt to make a living, they sold themselves as slaves. They didn't have a buyer. They sold themselves. That's what actually happened. So what this verse is talking about is not the African slave trade. This verse is talking about a historical event that occurred both to the, the northern tribes of Israel and the southern tribes of Israel during the Assyrian invasion. You don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Wait, speaking of the Assyrians, the, the 10 lost tribes were dispersed throughout all the nations. So, so the, folks, this is what ends up happening. When, when you get someone pinned, you saw this with Matt earlier. With, with both the, the atheist and the Catholic, when you get someone pinned, they just jump off. They, they ignore, just completely ignore what's being discussed and jump on to something completely different. Wait, okay. wait, wait, wait. I got to talk. I got to talk. I got to talk. Dang. Dang. So, so you got to deal with the context here. Oh, I got a question. Should white people be killed? That's my question. Should white people be killed because they're of the devil? Okay. When our Sorry. kingdom was established... 
Okay, so you think that white people should be killed when your kingdom ex is established? No, you will, you will, you will lick the dust off of the bottom of our sandals. Okay, and does that include Jesus, since he's whiter than white? That wasn't meant to be taken literally. The white man peer. Uh, it, he kind of made it pretty clear that that should be taken literally when he uses all those references to white being snow and white being whiter than bleach. Give me the verse again. Give me the verse. I'm gonna, I'm gonna expose you using the Greek lexicon. Uh, I'm I'm using your King James because I assume you're a King James only kind of guy. Of course. So I've well, King James gone to your King James. I've been reading to you from the King James, Mark chapter nine, verse three. I'll read it again. Mark nine three. King James was done by white people. <laughs> <laughs> they they painted that? over King James. Galvin's. <laughs> You, you so see, people who are the devil, white people, the ones who translated the King James that you think is authoritative. Well, you you twisted Mark nine three. Make no mistake. I, I read it. I read it. I, I'll read it again. And I'm reading it from said your, his the, garments. The, his garments became exceedingly and, white. It's not what it says in your King James. It says as his remnant became shining, exceedingly white as snow. So no fuller on earth can white them. That's what it says. Okay, he but the King James he, ain't accurate with the Greek every time. Hmm? The King James ain't... It says his raiment in King James. Raiment, not remnant. Raiment. Raiment means clothes. Sorry, which, which version of the King James are you using? Just the KJV, the original. No, you're not using the original. You're, you're yeah, using the We're talking about its clothes. You're reading you are, the authorized King you James. You have no clue what you're talking about. Which is the 1800s and later. You don't in even know Greek, that. It's talking about clothes. In the Greek, it says clothes. The word for, for raiment you know or whatever. That? Wait, no, that, that's, how do you know that that's literally what it's supposed to mean? In matia, which means an outer uh, garment, a cloak, or a rope. Oh, so you're, you're going to, you're, you're going to what now? You, you said you're King James. Now you don't want to go to King James. Look, look, the you Greek is more official than the King James. It. Is it saying that he's white? Is no. that what it says? It said his clothes are white. <laughs> you you, and it you says your twisting are, devil. And it says the ships are, the are dust literal, my boots. But it's not, right? <laughs> is, it, is that what it says? Is so so gonna, is it say is I mean because here's the thing here's the thing you cannot do you cannot stay with the scriptures in context interpreting it the same way you're, you're starting like a point trying is, to defend Marian devotion we're not defending Marian devotion yeah but you what you're saying is like similar to a Catholic it never works no here's the thing here's the thing what we're saying is we're reading it in context. You start with a conclusion, just like the Catholic did, just like the atheist did. You started with a conclusion, and you want to make everything fit that. And when you get something that doesn't fit that, like the very key passage that everything you want to try to argue that you're an Israelite is based on that Deuteronomy passage, and you cannot argue from that Deuteronomy Show that Mark 9-3 scripture to the screen. Huh? Put the Mark 9-3 on the screen. Show me. Here, I'll do it. I'll do it. You, you quote the scriptures. I'll put them up. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, he he's got to see it from the King James here, the King James nineteen hundred ver version. Nineteen hundred. Nineteen hundred. It's sixteen eleven. Oh. It was wrote. Oh, so, okay. Hold on. Let let me get his sixteen eleven. This would be great. I'll see if he could actually read it. Hold on. How many of you guys have ever seen an actual King James? This was a classic. <laughs> Now we're going to have some fun. All right, go ahead. Put it up this the is the 1611 version. Okay? Okay. And, oh, we will see. I'm going to hold up the screen, and we will see if he can read the 1611. Let's hey, hey, calm. I saw that comment you made. You know, Matt Slick. But yeah. Sakari's yeah. mixed. Sakari's mixed. I said, if a black guy and a white woman have a baby, is the baby a devil too? No, because no, 
No, only the woman's Here, let's, devil. Let's read, let's, okay. let's read this. The let's King read this James. from this version. Because here's the 1611 that says remnant. Let me see if I can get that. And his remnant became shining exceedingly it's white blurry. as snow. It's blurry. <laughs> Did everyone else read that fine? See, the 16th, I read, no, I can read it. But just hold it up very still. Hold, oh, oh uh, Nathan, I mean, Nathan, sheesh. Andrew, hold it up very still because people have not seen this. Don't this be very interesting. Just hold it there for a while and keep talking as still as you possibly can. Pretend you're, you're waiting to ambush me to buy me a meal. You're, you're waiting predatorily. Okay, hold it still. <laughs> and now, now talk because you know, people want to see this. Go ahead. Okay, so. I gotta move it right. So it says, and his remnant became shining, exceedingly white as snow. Raiment, raiment, raiment means is a garment. Raiment is a garment, an outer garment. Raiment is a robe, a cloak, reflection. No, no, it no. can include a garment, but it is his face. No, it's his garment. Really. In the, Dang. Old Testament, Dang. in the Old Testament, when Raymond is used for Moses, when he sits with God, his face was, his remnant was so bright, they had to put a veil over him. <clears throat> if it's his clothes, why would they have to put a face, a veil over his face? Who's in my patience? Because you keep twisting the scriptures, you devil. <laughs> okay, so this is the problem with you. You're very racist. And you cannot, you don't have patience. You can't handle what the scripture actually says. I'm sorry to say this. You're not us and not Jesus. You're the one who's twisting scripture. You cannot read it in context. You cannot take it. You, you, your one key verse in Deuteronomy does not speak about the African slave trade. It's impossible to be the African slave trade. Impossible. Because the African slave trade had buyers. What you wait, have to wait, wait, wait. Uh, you, I saw someone else use that up. By saying that only one word is literal, the word ships. And everything wait, else. Wait, 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 wait. Let me let me discuss that. You want to keep talking? I, I let me talk. Are you done now? I'm gonna talk about that. It's talking about their own people. Your own people won't buy you. Is that what it says? Yes. Okay, we'll read it again. And the Lord, who who is it? And the who? And Yah. Okay. And the Lord shall bring thee in again with ships by the way whereof I spoke unto thee. Thou shalt see it no more. And there ye shall be sold unto your enemies for bondsmen and bondwoman, and no one shall buy you. That doesn't but, say but you, your own people. It says no man shall buy. The use no, actually. It, what, whatever. <laughs> whatever. What can can you do? Can you do like I can? Can you do a search on your last name and trace it back to Abraham? What? What you? You're a Kazar. I'm a Levite. Absolutely not. Yeah. So the way we usually do genealogy is we go from so and so's father to so and so's father to so and so's father. We don't take a passage like this, and you perfectly explain that you don't, you cannot interpret it literally. Or figuratively, you're picking and choosing, and you have no basis for it. I'm going to show you the, the scriptures that, 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 that destroys all of you. Because you can't deal with this one. I want to know the scriptures that destroy all of us. That will be awesome. <laughs> and remember, go, it's going to destroy let's Jesus. Let's go to Romans. He's whiter than white. Romans. He's whiter than white. So Not white all is of white. Israel so or Israel. Said, you said earlier white was good. Then what's black? Wait, wait, wait. No, no, no. It means like, 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 not like skin, but like, like, you get it. Like, pure. Okay, what's the verse that destroys us? 
the, the one that says not at all Israel is Israel. Let me let me talk before let me let me explain everything. Give me like two minutes to explain everything before. Please, can I? Yeah. All right. Well, sorry, Mexican hold on. No one, no one's gonna be able to hear you on the show because you're not Mexican. edited in. Yeah. yeah. What are we doing with Mexicans? Yeah, Tyler said he's Mexican. I'm Mexican and Sicilian. What do you do with about Asian people? Oh well, now he's now he's, not, he's not part of the African slave trade. He's not he's not an Israelite. Thank no, you. I'm, you just I'm descended from the tribe of Gad, the natives. I'm the tribe of Ishish. But you're but you're not part what? of the African slave trade. You're Mexican. I'm really let's let's go to Romans. Let me let me read everything and explain I, it so folks, before folks, before folks, you come. I want to because this becomes important. What he just said is this is the thing that. The Hebrew Israelites argue is that the slave traders brought certain the people by tribes, and the folks in Jamaica are all one tribe, and the people in America were all one tribe, and the people that were brought that came to Mexico were one tribe. Now, just think about it: Would a slave trader really be concerned about keeping the tribes together? And what about the people who were left behind? Logically, what what a brother wait, 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 was wait, wait, let me Israel, read now. an Israelite, but the, his just other brother me, wasn't. So the, the passage he brought up. Three minutes to read and explain, please. Yep. Go for it. I'll give you three minutes. We're going long, but we'll give you three minutes. So it says, not all Israel are Israel. Now, now I'm going to take you to the Genesis. No, 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 no. You can't do that. You're going to stay in Romans 9. But this, this is related to it. No, because we, the rest of Romans nine is going to prove that what you're you're going to argue Fine, is false. Whatever, whatever. Yeah, you know what? I got an idea. I had an idea because this is really ridiculous. Why don't we see how he does so we can learn how the BHI exegete stuff and what they do with scripture? It'd be a good lesson to watch them hopscotch around and, and make a quilt work of heresy. Okay. So we're we're going we're to give you a couple minutes to do this, and let me let folks know what he's going to do. Uh, he's going to take a passage uh, from Isaiah yeah. where it says. Line upon line, precept upon precept. And what he's going to do is show you their view of precept upon precept, jumping all over the Bible. And I'm going to say this up front, and you're going to prove that I'm right. He's going to jump all over the place, taking a word from here and a word that has the same word somewhere else, take them out of it, rip them right out of their contexts, slam them no, together. No, that's you. That is you. Let's see what he says. Let's, let's see. And, and we already know that. Saying. Let's see. Damn, so go for it. Keep interrupting. Mm. Are are you losing patience? Okay, come on. Let, let, let him do it. I want to hear what he's gonna steal. I want this to be great. Thank you, Matt Flick. <laughs> you should say thank you, he devil, but go ahead. I, I want him to hear, hear him say thank you, your majesty to you, Matt. I'd yeah. like to hear that. Never what, you went to so Romans wait, wait, wait. What's your next verse? Yeah, wait, wait, please, please. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Genesis twenty two eighteen. So all the nations refer to the tribes of Israel. And, and I'm just going to keep going. Just don't interrupt me. You see, Romans 9 6. Not all of Israel are Israel. You see, you see, uh, it is through Isaac, the seed of the promise. Now, now the, the, the descendants of Israel. But the, the other brothers of Isaac, you see, though the descendants of Isaac's brothers will be safe, not anyone else. Only the people who are the descendants of Abraham. Wow. <laughs> are you done? He left. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if he did that. On per okay, here he is. Let's put him back in. Don't know what happened there. There you go. You're back in, Prez. Are you there? Yeah. You're muted. Okay. You dropped out. Go back. So I said that, like, all the, like, Paul is writing to, they are all the descendants of Abraham's sons who are not Isaac. You see? Are you are you done? Or are you still gone? So none of you heathens can be saved. 
Wait, 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 I'm trying to get the verses down. Romans 9, 6. Not all Israel is Israel. Uh, Genesis 22, 18. In your seed, all the nations shall be blessed. What was the other verse? You said what? What was the other verse? What was the other verse? So, uh, let me go to Romans 9, 7. Neither because are the, they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall they see be called. Now, Yahweh Shai, Jesus Christ, died for the descendants of Abraham's other sons. Why Why did you skip the part in between Romans 6 that you read and Romans 7 that you read? Why did you skip the part in the middle? What? What's where the part it says, in the middle? Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. That the, the one that actually defines that they are all the seed of Abraham that he's speaking of. So when he says Israel, he clarified it. Yeah, but did you hear what I said, though? Yeah. You you interjected things. You, you made claims that aren't from Scripture. You inserted it. You said, because there's nowhere here that Paul says he's speaking to the group that's claiming. He, he made it clear who he's speaking to. Go back to your caves. Oh, now we're going to James. Dang. James what? Where are we going in James? Wait, who's James? James. Are you going to the book of James now? Why would I go to the book of James? <laughs> Why did you say James? <laughs> I did not say James. You barely yes, fast when they tell me you read yes, devil. You said, you said, you said, let's go to James. <laughs> this is great, dude. You got to go back to the audio. This is awesome. I, mean, I like what you Charlie said. This is verbal yeah. waterboarding. <laughs> this is <that's> awesome. <laughs> yeah, the comments in here are great. The verbal. <laughs> this is great. Oh man, you're making me you laugh. Oh, you yeah. your father the devil because you're telling lies. Okay, now. The, the fact is, you can't stay to a pastor. I hope you do come back in. We're, we got we to gotta end it because I know the guys at the council are You look like Isa. Isa. You look so, like, just like Isa. Yeah, I, I look just like a Jewish person, a Hebrew would look, because I'm Hebrew, because I'm from the line of Korah through Levi. And stop stop bending the scripture. Abraham. Stop disrespecting my God. Don't your you ever disrespect my God. God. Your God, God is the whacked. devil. That's who your God is. And we pray for you because if you don't repent of wow. this racist religion that you hold to, you will spend eternity in a lake of fire. Do you not see that? This That's is not you. about race. This is about redemption. Our sinners, both of us, you and I both deserve God's eternal punishment because we break his law. You and I both I have to break no laws. What are you talking about? You talking about? The difference oh, is that this is what the scriptures say. Those scriptures you don't. You are a devil. You are a devil. <laughs> what do you what do? The guys. The guy is a great example of of someone who is extremely brainwashed in a really wacko cult, and all that's happening is the devil is using his own racism to justify hatred. And you don't even know what you're talking about. about. Dude, well, I, I do. I've been, I do because <laughs> I can't know what I'm talking about because I'm autistic. Um, I've, I've been studying cults for 39 years, buddy. Um, I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. Well, guys, we got to get the core recordings. So you, <laughs> you devil, and all the other ones in there. This is great stuff. Oh man, I'm sorry, but dude, look. Andrew Come on, stop laughing at me. Look, I'm sorry. It's, it's so ridiculous. You are so ridiculous. You're such an incredible racist. You're so full of hate, condemnation, and racism. No worries. You You're going to be my slave soon. <laughs> wow. God. So here's the thing. Here, here's the, And this is this is why I have so much disrespect for people that hold to the position. I ain't going to bring peace but a sword. Yeah. And, and you know what? <laughs> this is... This is dangerous That's, thinking. Dangerous. That? Yeah. That was that is not you. That's Jesus. Now you're claiming that you're you're What does your people do? Okay. Maybe this guy you get rid of him. He's 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 yeah.
So, yeah. so here, here's the thing. I want, I want him to hear the gospel first. Yeah. Because he doesn't know it, and he, you know, Perez, listen. You have to realize that what Scripture says is all men fall short of the glory of God. Every one of them. All men. All men, Israelites, the nation of Israel. So it says all have fallen short of the glory of God. All sin. Okay? That's every single human being breaks God's law. Yeah, I do know what I'm talking about because I was actually quoting scripture something you can't do and the fact that you don't even know that i quoted scripture shows how much a devil you are perez you can whisper it but i heard you here's the reality I'll be back. Perez. perez you could whisper that we don't know what we're talking about but the fact that you don't even realize that we quoted scripture that's the thing that's scary because you actually think you're an israelite and that you're spiritual and you don't even know what scripture is. You only know the devil's talk, lies. That's all you seem to know. And if you die, you will spend eternity in a lake of fire because you and I both deserve that. You and I both deserve eternity in a lake of fire. However, Jesus Christ, that one that was transfigured and was so white, he was white as snow, whiter that no fuller can white him. That Jesus died on a cross to be a payment of sin that you could be forgiven of your racism, your hatred. You may feel emboldened because you are surrounded by a bunch of people that want to racism, but you're no better than the white supremacists out there. You're no better than them. And that's why I have so little respect for people that come in and, and give that kind of racism because it's sinful and it's wrong. And you'd be hard on it for anybody that would be a white supremacist, I'm sure. And you don't see that you're the same thing. And if you die in your sin, you will spend eternity in a lake of fire. If you understood the passage that you were quoting, that not all Israel is saying there that even though they're born of abraham doesn't mean they're going to heaven it doesn't mean they're god's spiritual children it means that they're people who are trusting in something like you trust in the color of your skin and by the way as you said you're mexican then you wouldn't be a hebrew israelite from the african slave trade you wouldn't have been part of it so you would not be an israelite so by name you would be a white devil you're not a hebrew israelite even in your own belief what are you talking about i'm back <laughs> i am back but i said i'm back not with the no so so the thing is you know i i think he just tunes us out whenever we share the gospel with him so we're gonna we're gonna close it up um wait give me a minute give me a minute so i want to share something no, actually, I'm not going to give you a minute. Um, so we're going to close up. Uh, I don't know if, uh, let's see, is John, Vince, if you're here, do we have a link to the uh, to the after show? Yes, we do. Okay. All right. We're going to put a link to the council um, for the after show. So that, that link is in here. If anyone wants to go over there. Um, folks, this is you know i i want folks to realize that we'll see you next week i'm going helpful. there where are you going i'm going over to the council okay so, so up, matt's going to head over to the the council okay. and i'm going to put the link into into uh youtube comments so here's the thing folks you know we saw three examples we, we saw someone who came in and wanted to start with a conclusion that all morality is subjective and then define things in such a way that they can only be his, his that his way he comes up with his own definition so his way is the only way to conclude things then what do you have you had a roman catholic that came in wanted to do the same thing starts with a conclusion but when matt asked him well how do you know these things are these supernatural things are really from god he had to do the same thing that the atheist had to do by arguing from his conclusion you had the same thing with this hebrew israelite who starts with the conclusion he's a Hebrew Israelite, 
and then from there wants to argue. But what you don't see is if we, any one of the three cases. Now, first one didn't want to argue scripture, so it's a little different there. But with the Catholic and Hebrew Israelite, you see that they cannot take scripture within context. They can't look at the scripture. What do they? What do they do? You saw with both of them, they want to jump all around. You saw it with all three that in the thinking they want to jump all at the point when, when the that point up, uh, but that's logically invalid. I'll just jump over to something else and ignore the fact of the logical fallacy that was there. And so this is what you end up seeing. You see this over and over again. This is when you have the truth, like we're doing with Matt and I, we're just reading the scriptures. We can just say, this is what God says. And that's, we don't have to sit here and jump and do all these gymnastics. Why? Because you don't have to do that when you have the truth. You, you, can't argue against truth with lies because the lies you have to always do these gymnastics want to give uh just some quick things for folks to tune in matt slick has a radio show you can go if you want to call in during the week he's got monday through uh, monday through friday from uh three to four uh pacific time um you could go to karm.org to get the details there if you want to listen if you want you can search for it if you want to listen on podcast just search for matt slick um it's on sermon audio you'll be able to get it there it's the matt slick live show this podcast well this becomes a podcast this vi video so those who watch live thursday nights 8 to 10 and it should be at 10 but uh like tonight we thought it was a little bit educational or entertaining went a little bit longer so what you see is we we go We'll take this, we'll turn it into a podcast. So if you prefer listening, you can subscribe to the Apologetics Live. Uh, also, since you're out of podcast, let me recommend my own podcast. Go search for Rap Report. We have two of them. We have Monday through Friday, two minutes. If you like short biblical interpretations and applications, we do that. What we're doing right now is going through the entire Bible, all 66 books, in two minutes, giving an overview, two minutes a day. To, dealing with another book each day. Uh, the longer ones we have are the rap reports. So the rap report daily or the short ones. You could subscribe to the rap report. That one is going to be about an hour long. I think what's coming up next may be an interview with Todd Friol. Um, I don't know because we have some a special thing that we might do. So, uh, but those are some things to look forward to. So, so go subscribe to them and, uh, I guess what we'll do is we'll close out for folks who want. We're going to close out with what it, with John Wilkinson losing it with the babies exist. There's no sense in having a conversation with someone who, who just can't even recognize the statement that babies exist. Well, you blah blah blah. You know, give me a break. We're never going to get anywhere. He's not. Uh, he's not having a, a normal conversation. We're just going to move on to something else. It's ridiculous. He's not interested in a conversation. He's no, no. He's just interested in arguing. I am in infinite. That's all. I just know. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I just trapped him. No, I, find out. Dude, that's, that, I already decided. As soon as I said, you know, how is he going to answer this? Would babies exist? If he gives me a hard time, we're just moving on. You know. All right. John, you had something you wanted to say? I was going to say, he doesn't want to have a conversation. No. You asked him a very simple question. Do babies right. exist? And he has to dodge that? Well, I mean, if you want to be very yeah. quick. We have to, we have well, no, to it's a simple question. It's, it's like two plus two. It's two plus two. Okay? It's simple. It's simple. Uh, you know, it's, simple. Simple. it's, simple. To, you know, it's a simple freaking question. Come on. Well, you're a freaking idiot. John's a little fired. I'm not gonna lose it. I'm just gonna lose it. I'm just. I'm. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of these games. Oh, I mean, all there's no such thing as babies. Have to first, uh, get, get well, the babies. I, 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 I kid you not, man. You guys will do anything you can to deny God. You will do anything. You will do anything to deny God. You guys are idiots. I don't deny God. So. Tell us what you really think, John. <laughs> oh, he's saying it. I'm telling you, man. I just, I'm very oh. aware of Matt's uh, more quicker. All right. So there's, there's no babies. 